Good evening, everyone. We've reached the hour of six o'clock, Tuesday, August 17, 2021. This is the meeting of the City Council of the City of Woodland. We are now in session and we are going to proceed to the roll call. And I ask our clerk, Anna Gonzalez, to do that roll call. Anna. Thank you, Mayor Stollard. Mayor Pro Tem Vega. Present. Council Member Fernandez. Present. Council Member Garcia Cadena. Present. Council Member Landsberg. Present. Mayor Stollard. Present. Thank you. The record will reflect the fact that all members of the council are present this evening. This meeting is also being conducted electronically pursuant to the governor's executive order, which means we are all at remote locations. Uh, and uh, members of the public are still welcome to communicate with us by email to our clerk, or uh, they can call in at any time at, during the meeting during public comment, and we'll advise people when that will happen. If you don't have immediate access to the agenda, you will find it on the city website, www.cityofwoodland.org. Uh, click on the meetings and agendas button, and uh, you'll find this evening's meetings agenda with instructions on how to communicate. With that, we'll move on to the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'd like to ask our Communications Director, Spencer Bowen, to lead us in the pledge. Spencer? Let's rise. Good evening, Council. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> thank you Spen thank you spencer uh, this brings us to public comment this is the time when members of the public are invited to address the council on items that are not otherwise on the agenda this evening if you have a comment on something that is on the agenda we will have comment when we get to the, those respective items so uh, madam clerk does anyone wish to address us uh, within the three minute limit uh, tonight uh, I do have a gentleman by the name of Noah Lopez raising his hand. Please. Uh, Noah, if, if you're on the phone, go ahead. Hello, council members. My name is Noah Lopez. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you for allowing my comment today. I sent a letter to all of you earlier today about uh, some trash that has been accumulating on Southeast Street between roads 24A and 25A. And I want to thank you, Mayor Stollard, for replying to my email so swiftly. Um, you informed me that that section of road is actually part of unincorporated Lowell County. Um, so I, I understand that uh, there's some coordination that would have to be done with the county supervisors for that issue. Um, really quickly, I wanted to summarize the content of the letter. Um, as I said, there's been lots of trash accumulating piles and piles. Um, on that section of road between 24A and 25A. This section goes right by the sports park as well as the community center. And I think that uh, for me, that, that, that seems like a shame seeing as lots of people come into our beautiful city um, to engage in tournaments and, and go to the sports park. And it's unfortunate to think that their first impression, possibly only impression of Woodland is that trash lined section of road. Um, in my letter, I propose a community cleanup event. I think that uh, there's, I know myself and many other members of the community would probably be very happy to, to help and volunteer in cleaning up that trash. And I just wanted to um, encourage action to work with um, the Yolo, Yolo County to put together a community cleanup event. Um, I wanted to volunteer my time, not only in picking up the trash, but also in organizing more volunteers. Um, I really want to say thank you for the work you guys do and um, I hope to see action on that item. Thank you, Noah. We appreciate your, your good hearted willingness to work with us to solve a problem. Uh, we have been dealing with it and we'll continue and we'll see what we can do to implement your good idea. Uh, perhaps that can be referred to uh, appropriate staff member, Mr. Manager. All right. Uh, Thank you. The, were there any additional comments this evening, uh, Madam Clerk? Yes, I have two emails I would like to read. Please proceed. Thank are you. they re are they un not related to anything on the agenda tonight? Correct. They're related to Ralph Harris Park. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. 
This is from Christy Pierce. Harris Park has become a haven for transients together. The neighborhood has seen drug deals, people being shot up, sexual favors, cars in pieces, people living in cars and spending nights in the park and gunshots being fired. Lights were recently installed and destroyed within a day. We are waiting for cameras to be installed. How will they be kept operable and what will be done with the footage? I have lived in this neighborhood my entire life and have never seen these types of issues until recently. We used to be able to enjoy the park and our front yard, but now feel unsafe. Problems at the park keep growing. Please help us make our neighborhood safe again. And this one is from Nigel King regarding Harris Park. Hello all, thank you for taking the time to hear me out. I'm still beyond frustrated with the goings on at Harris Park. The drugs, sex for services, daily trash, people sleeping in the playground equipment, people camping there, same vehicles parked there all day and night, especially the blue SUV, which is the biggest trash contributor. I've taken pictures of what people, what of what look like drug exchanges, so has my husband, to which that person in the vehicle drove by our house and asked him if he was taking pictures, to which my husband replied, yep, and walked away. We even had gunfire right in the front of our house back in July. There was approximately seven bullet casings in the street, the front of my vehicle. Other than my neighbors, I no longer enjoy my neighborhood. We don't feel safe. The whole city has been inundated with transients like never before. Why is Woodland a one-way ticket in, in for all this? Is it because of all the buildup on Beamer? If I could move tomorrow, I would. I truly appreciate the efforts that the city had made with removing the tables, barbecue grills, locking the bathrooms and installing security lights that were immediately vandalized. We're sorry that families and others can't enjoy the park like before. We greatly appreciate the police presence. We have an elderly gentleman down the street that walks over and cleans up these people's messes. Not that it stays clean long, this is daily. I'm all for sharing the park with everyone, but not like this. We now have kids going to school and they have to be exposed to this. Will they come across the syringes? I know we are supposed to keep cameras installed in the park. We are supposed to get cameras installed in the park. I hope they are high enough and spread throughout the park. But what will happen then? Please take a moment to randomly drive by and see what daily life has become here. I don't see this at other parks just because Harris Park is out of sight, doesn't put it out of mind. I've already heard that Harris is the new Wino Park. Thank you for your attention in this highly frustrating matter. I know this won't solve itself overnight, but we need continuous help. Sincerely, Nigel King. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Did you have any others? No. All right, we appreciate people taking the time and trouble to share their concerns with our council. With that, we conclude public comment and we remove, move along to item E, communications from the council and staff. And why don't we start tonight with, uh, with Myra Vega, the mayor pro tem. Here. Mayor Seller, sorry, I was on mute. Thank you, um, happy to see everybody back. Um, I, during uh, our council races, I had the opportunity to participate in my regular assignments. Um, that I participate in and also had uh, the opportunity to meet some uh, with some community members uh, around some issues that they uh, would like some clarification and discussion. Um, other than that, I'm looking forward to the fall and hopefully um, as things um, hopefully turn in the right directions be in person. That'll be all for me today. Mayor Slaughter, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Vega. Next we'll go to council member Rich Landsberg. Rich. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It has been a busy last couple of weeks, even though we have been on a break. Besides the my committee assignments, which included the Housing Authority, the Executive Commission for Homelessness, and our weekly 150th Celebration Committee, uh, I also had the uh, opportunity to uh, be escorted by Police Department's Lieutenant Tom Davis at the National Night Out, I think it was August 3rd. I met and spoke with a lot of great people and our neighbors in, the, in District 1. Uh, these folks care about our city, care about what happens to our city and are willing to help uh, make this place a better a place to live. They also, at the same time, Mr. Mayor shared their concerns and the concerns are consistent, as you know, homelessness and traffic continue to be the number two, one and two topics in the community. Um, also, Mr. Mayor, want to make sure that everybody knows that 
the 150th committee uh, is making videos for our 150th. And the first one, the first video was released a few days ago. It's only about four minutes long. And I would invite you to look at the four minute video, which captures uh, some history of our great city. And you can find that uh, video on our city's website. You can find it on the celebratewoodland.org website. You can also find it on the City of Woodland's YouTube channel. So we have places you can go to go look at this video. It's a great job by those people who are involved in making the videos. Also, Mr. Mayor, I was participated in an interview with Comstock Magazine, who will be featuring our city in an October uh, uh, publication. Look forward to that publication. Lastly, Mr. Mayor, uh, I don't need to remind you or anybody else that we're in a drought. There's no question about it. And almost daily, I get a, a question from individuals who are concerned about water wasting in our community, uh, either by individuals, by companies, and even our own city and our school district uh, is uh, being looked at for water wasting. This is not a good example if we're doing that. And I hope that our city cleans up its act before we start asking people to conserve as well. But having said that, we all need to do our part to conserve water. It is, as you know, Mr. Mayor, a critical year for water. And that's all I have tonight, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Landsberg. And now, Council Member Tanya Garcia Cadena. Tanya? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I would like to start by thanking Chief Calf, Deputy Chief Cucci, Sergeant Danzel, City Manager Ken Hyatt, and our Crime Prevention Specialist Morgan Snedeker for coordinating and conducting a community information meeting at Schneider Park um, in District 3. That was on July 28th. We have some concerns in that area and we wanted to meet with the community members and we had a small turnout, but it was, I think, extremely helpful. And um, that kind of fed right into National Night Out as um, Council Member Landsberg talked about. So uh, congratulations to Morgan Snedeker. Again, she coordinated 41 National Night Out events. That's a, a record for the City of Woodland. So that's great. I hope to see those continue to grow. Um, also, I would like to encourage everyone to get tested for COVID-19 on a regular basis, regardless of your vaccine status. Um, please just put it on your calendar and um, head on down to the Hansen Clinic on the corner of Cottonwood and Beamer and get tested on a weekly basis. We really need to get this under control. We are losing community members and we need to, um, we need to test and, and see who has the, the vaccine so that they can self-quarantine. It's um, being spread and people don't realize they have it. And then lastly, I want to wish a happy and safe first day of school to our students and our amazing staff. School begins on Thursday for most students in our district. And um, I, just, I just hope that everything goes smoothly and that everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you. That's it for me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Garcia Cadena. And now Council Member Vicki Fernandez. Vicki? Uh, thank you, Mayor Sallard. Um, I'd also like to thank Morgan um, for her organization of the National Night Out uh, in our community. And also, I had the pleasure of riding along with Lieutenant Aaron DeLau. So um, very impressed with his ability to deal with our very young uh, community members who had um, some very um, serious questions about uh, their career path choices. And he was very receptive and willing to answer um, the little one's questions and um, also had the opportunity to meet with community members um, in another area where they had um, concerns about um, current um, or burglaries in their neighborhood. And again, the issue of um, 
firework um, noise in their neighborhood. And again, he was very receptive and very informative and helpful. So hopefully out of um, National Night Out, we'll get a few more um, neighborhood watch programs going in our community that might help us um, interact with our community members and our law enforcement to try and help resolve some of these issues. So um, I hope that this was an opportunity for people to feel comfortable to communicate and, and organize their neighborhoods. Um, secondly, I'd also like to um, mentioned that um, um, our city manager, Ken Hyatt, was instrumental in organizing another um, neighborhood um, informational meeting at Campbell Park, which will be coming up on August 24th at 6 uh, p.m. to address some of the concerns on traffic and um, and issues around Campbell Park. So inviting anyone who's interested in attending. Um, again, Morgan was instrumental in helping pass out flyers with volunteers and myself uh, to make contact with community members in that area. Um, and hopefully we'll have a great turnout on August 24th. Um, also, um, if anyone is interested, the Yellow ha uh, Habitat Conservancy uh, Implementation Advisory Commission is looking for um, a community member uh, to serve on that uh, commission. So if you are interested, um, please reach out to myself or Cindy Norris with the city of Woodland. And um, hopefully we can get someone appointed from um, Woodland. And um, lastly, I would like to um, thank um, our superintendent of schools, Garth Lewis and Dr. Jesse Ortiz um, for their vision and um, uh, and collaboration with the California Human Development Corporation. Um, they um, have a amazing program for workforce development out at um, the Yellow County Office of Ed called the Corazon Center, which um, provides different type of um, training. We were able to uh, visit with uh, Congressman Garamendi, um, the facility and um, also Grow West who has provided a, a space for um, the uh, truck driver uh, training program that they have out there at the Grow West uh, property. Hoping that the city of Woodland could maybe follow their lead and, and implement some of the great ideas that um, they had the foresight to, to invest in and collaborate with. And uh, hopefully the city of Woodland will, will follow suit um, to help develop um, um, workforce training for community members um, and provide a, an opportunity for upward mobility uh, for their families and themselves. And again, as um, my um, colleague um, Tanya Garcia Cadena said, um, we're wishing all our students and teachers uh, welcome back um, to the new school year. So um, thank you, Mayor Stallard, for your time. Uh, thank you, Council Member Fernandez. <clears throat> for myself, I can only say Thank you, colleagues. You've done such a great job of reporting on the many things that have been going on. Uh, although we call it a recess, it, it's really only one skipped council meeting and all of our other commitments still can seem to continue. Plus the usual summertime events that also involve us as representatives of the community. Uh, I, I can't say any more. The National Night Out was a terrific success. There were 14 gatherings in my uh, council district and I got to 13 of them. The 14th actually got canceled because of COVID in the family. Uh, I also wanna mention that for the benefit of everyone, that Woodland is a member of the US Conference of Mayors. And every Tuesday, I get the privilege of being on an hour long call with the uh, Inter Office of Intergovernmental Relations at the White House. It's pretty cool to hear from cabinet secretaries and other people in those kinds of positions talking with mayors around the country. Today, we heard from Ms. Walensky at the, who heads up the CDC in Atlanta. And that's the, um, anyway, uh, this Center for Disease Control. Anyway, it's a very important agency. And she just is so frustrated that we can't do better in getting the vaccination levels up in this country. Uh, she presented statistics which showed of the, of the states which have the very highest infection rate, they are the very lowest in vaccination rates. I mean, it's an unmistakable correlation. Uh, it's unfortunate that politics got in the middle of public health and people seem to claim their right not to get vaccinated uh, for reasons that are just beyond me. But 
our community, our whole country is now in a red zone, a whole country. Uh, the worst states are the ones, again, with the lowest vaccination rates. But we've got to get a handle on this. Uh, and I'm embarrassed that we aren't at 70% in Yolo County. I would think that we would be enlightened enough to realize this was a simple thing to do. It doesn't cost any money, hardly takes any time. And it's really not a big imposition. But people seem to look at it from their own personal perspective as whether or not they want to do it. At the same time, they can become transmitters if they don't do it and they can track the disease and they can spread it to family, friends, loved ones, and it's happening. So community, for those of you watching and listening, do whatever you can. Use your social media as an opportunity to say, please do it. I mean, we don't wanna be in a shutdown situation again and yet that's starting to happen. Things are getting canceled because, uh, because of this. Well, that was my mayor's minute. And I'm, you know, I know it's the same thing I've said two or three times before, but it doesn't seem like we're making the progress we need to make. Now, one thing that council member, I think it was you, Vicky, who said, or maybe uh, Tanya, get, get tested. It's easy enough to do. The Hanson Clinic is there. This is a Monday to Friday thing. Uh, there's a website. Uh, the county's public health, where you can check those hours or Hanson Clinic website, go down there. It's a spit test. It's a simple little thing. It takes you all about two minutes once you're there and, uh, and find out. And if, and if you want to get vaccinated, you can do that there too. All right. That concludes my <laughs> screed on the issue of vaccination. But we've got to figure this out at some point in time where we're going to be going around the same track for a, for a third year. All right, we will now move along uh, to our to our city manager and, and his regular council report, Mr. Hyatt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it's great to be back in session with you. I hope you enjoyed uh, a brief um, but uh, restful uh, respite from council calendars. Uh, I know you all worked very hard, so thank you for continuing your assignments uh, and going above and beyond. Um, real quick, a uh, Couple things. Uh, first, I do want to acknowledge the county's cooperation with uh, the cleanup on Southeast Street. Um, this was uh, something that they weren't uh, necessarily planning to do or prepared to do, but uh, they mobilized quickly. And I do want to acknowledge their partnership in uh, uh, helping us with that situation. Um, also, as we you know get back into uh, school session and uh, we're rushing kids uh, to and from activities in school. Uh, Certainly uh, parents have noticed around town, there's a lot of construction activity. And I just wanna caution uh, folks to please be cautious as you uh, drive around town. There's uh, a lot of construction activity uh, going on. Um, so pay attention and uh, please be patient and uh, alert and attentive uh, as you uh, go through the community. So real uh, quick, did wanna to touch on the next council meetings um, calendar. September 7th will be the next convening of the council. Uh, we'll start off with a presentation from the police chief. Uh, he's gonna outline for the council and the community uh, their updated uh, department strategic plan. Um, so excited to see uh, what's come out of that process um, and uh, the chief's leadership in working with his staff and the community to outline a strategic plan moving forward for the department. Uh, we will also have a, a healthy conversation and some action around uh, housing policy here. Uh, the city of Woodlands uh, will be asking the council to adopt its uh, housing elements, uh, which is a mandatory uh, state requirement. Um, and we're at the final stages of adopting that housing element, which will set uh, our housing uh, objectives and goals and actions for uh, the coming uh, five to seven years. Uh, we will also provide a report on our uh, housing loan portfolio and the status of our affordable housing funds to give the council, particularly the new council members that uh, might not be as familiar with uh, the city's housing programs and how we're investing in uh, supporting housing uh, needs for um, those in, in need in the community. So uh, be prepared for a lot of information, a lot of data, but important topic around housing uh, here in Woodlands. Um, and then we'll close out the meeting with an update on the city council goals and priority actions. Uh, originally, I had anticipated to have that on this agenda this evening, but uh, seeing the, uh, the length of the agenda, I thought it best to hold off until the 7th to give it uh, ample time for discussion. So uh, that concludes my presentation. I'll hand it back to you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Hyatt. And I know everybody was busy around City Hall also during our break, so-called break. 
<laughs> so that brings us back to our agenda and uh, we are now ready for the consent calendar. This is items two through 13. Is there any item on the consent calendar that any member of the council wishes to remove for separate discussion or protect perhaps just a comment on something that could remain on the calendar? Mayor Stellard. Council Member Vega, Mayor Pro Tem Vega, excuse me. Thank you, thank you. So I do, I have, I would like a little bit more uh, detail and some questions around 11 and 13. Um, can I move forward and ask them? Uh, do, yes, if you wish to ask them at this time, we could still leave them on the consent calendar or we do prefer that they be handled separately from the consent calendar. Let's go ahead and handle them separately, please. All right, then the consent calendar will be, include items two through 12, less items 11 and, uh, and 12, excuse me. Yeah, and 11 and 13 will take immediately after the consent calendar. Does any, any other member of the council have an item they wish to uh, take Mayor, on? Yes, a Mr. Master. It's comment. items number six and number nine. Please number proceed six. with your comments. Number six is the police department quarterly status report. Mm -hmm. Number nine is the fire departments. And some time ago, Mr. Mayor, it wasn't that long ago that I asked for greater details regarding arson fires, which continue to plague our city. Our quarterlies have not been coordinated enough for my satisfaction to the fire department and the police department. I just think we need to address these arson fires a little closer before someone gets hurt. Just a couple of weekends ago, Mr. Mayor, we had an arson fire on California Street, which left a few people homeless. We need an emphasis on whoever these firebugs are. I understand that many of the arson fires are dumpster fires, but a dumpster fire can become a deadly fire within minutes. I'm just asking for greater coordination between the fire department and the police department regarding these arsons. And I specifically have asked Chief Zane to weigh in, Mr. Mayor, uh, regarding uh, the new item that he put into his quarterly report, which is a breakdown of the arson fires. Uh, would you like specific action at a future council meeting or a briefing? What would you prefer? I, I believe that Mr. Uh, that the Chief Zane is going to work closely with the police department, but I, I was inviting him to explain the uh, graph that he submitted in the quarterly regarding arson fires and how exactly, you know, his stats may be differed from the police departments and what they're doing about it, Mr. Mayor. All right, well, well Mr. Chief Zane is on the call this evening. Perhaps we could have him respond at this time. Chief Zane? Yes, uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, address you this evening regarding our current arson fire situation within the city of Woodland. Uh, now, the metrics that you're seeing are obviously new uh, for you. And so trying to put that into context, what does that actually mean for the city? Well, currently year to date, or I should say from uh, January 1st to June 30th, we've had uh, 32 intentional fires in the city. Mm. And uh, last year in 2020, we had a total of 38 uh, arson fires for the entire year. And in 2019, we had 32. So we're on pace to really almost double uh, the arson fires that we had uh, from 2019 to, to date, um, if the trend continues. Um, in the field, I can tell you that our personnel do work closely with law enforcement. Um, to give you an example, uh, just a few weeks ago, less than a few weeks ago, we had a string of dumpster fires in our downtown corridor uh, kind of the West Court, West Main Street area between West Street and Cottonwood. And while the crews were, uh, the fire crews were out uh, suppressing those fires, law enforcement PD, Woodland PD was in the area looking for a, a suspect. Now, fortunately enough, uh, the business owners in that corridor have uh, good cameras, security cameras. And through the work of uh, the detectives with the Woodland Police Department, uh, they were able to identify a suspect that they had already previously arrested for warrants. 
and they were able to add that additional arrest for at least four of the uh, eight total fires based off of the surveillance footage that they received. Uh, about a week prior to that, firefighters were on scene of a fire that caused damage uh, to uh, a, a, um, a moving company. And uh, there was a suspect on scene that confessed to the firefighters that, that they had lit the fire. Um, Woodland PD was called out and arrest was made. Um, since those two arrests, um, we have not seen uh, the continued arson issue that we've been having. That doesn't mean that it's completely gone. Um, and we are uh, you know, watching these closely. Um, when they do occur, we do coordinate. Um, Chief Caff and I talk on a regular basis. Um, so we will continue to uh, work closely to try and identify these uh, subjects. Uh, and I can tell you, this is not a Woodland specific issue. We're having issues in our unincorporated area in the county. Um, and our neighboring jurisdictions are also having um, issues. Uh, so we will be doing everything that we can to try and lessen the impact. Um, having the uh, old juvenile hall torn down um, will help us dramatically. Uh, several of the uh, structure fires that were deemed intentional were inside of that building. Um, and uh, you know, having access and, and working with the county and, and, and working to eliminate some of these uh, buildings that are haphazard uh, definitely helps reduce our impact um, of arsons. So um, I hope that answers some of your questions. And again, um, we will continue to coordinate with PD and further that coordination in an attempt to uh, reduce the impact on our community. Thank you, Thank you Chief nice Sane. Mr. Landsberg, do you feel that, is that a sufficient response for this moment? It is, Mr. Mayor, and I trust the judgment of our fire chief and our police chief to get a handle on this um, terrible issue that's been going on for this year. Thank you. Thank you for surfacing the issue tonight. Uh, any council member have any other item they want to comment on on the consent calendar or remove for independent consideration? Uh, council member Fernandez. Council Member Fernandez. Um, I just wanted to make a quick, um, maybe amendment to the minutes from the July 6th. Um, for the closing, it um, lists um, Deacon Joel um, from Holy Rosary Church. Just wanted to clarify that that's Deacon Cole with a K. Um, Thank on you. Thank you for the clarification. And then the other item I wanted to address um, was the police uh, report. Um, quarterly report. I just wanted to take a moment to welcome the new staff members that are listed on that report. If you'll give me the liberty to do that. Um, I haven't welcomed them. So Officer Kayla Schweitzer, I'm not sure I pronounced that correctly. Officer Sierra Brewer, Record Specialist Alexa Osegueda, and uh, Record Specialist Maria Roa. So I just want to welcome them to the city of Woodland and, and hope that they have a successful career with uh, with the city of Woodland. So welcome. Thank you, Councilmember Fernandez, and I hope that you'll accept the fact that that welcomes on behalf of all of us. Okay. All right. Uh, now let's hear if there's any public comment on the consent calendar. Madam Clerk. I, I do have two emails related to item number 12. So I'll go ahead and read the first one is from Alejandra Alvarez. And she says, the current fee schedule for Summertime Fun Club is $550 for the entire summer program. It went up from $500 in 2020. This is an essential and valuable resource for working families in Woodland. Passing an approximately 300% price increase will blindside the families that have been relying on it for years and that expect the cost to be within a much lower range. Price increases should continue to be gradual. Thank you. And the next email I have is from Kim Ralph Smith, also item 12. As a member of the local child care planning council, this item concerns me deeply. Child care for school age children is in short supply. According to our most recent needs assessment, and this will severely impact families already struggling due to the loss of child care slots in Woodland. The LPC has been working on this issue for a very long time and I would encourage the participation of someone staff or council member attending the LPC meeting on a regular basis so that we are better coordinated and not inadvertently working against each other. Thank you, Kim Ralph Smith, Local Child Care Planning Council District 3. 
And that's all, right. all I have to consider. Thank you for those two comments. Uh, I do believe- We have one voicemail as well. Oh, well, let's hear for the voicemail. Thank you. Hi, this is Tony Smith again. I see you're gonna be talking about the child care for the summer program a 300% price increase for people that really need it, I think that is irrational because it's too much money for so many people. There's got to be a better way. I pray there's funds somewhere. All I know is I pay $14,000 a year in taxes. So I'm concerned about the children. Thank you. Thank you. In light of those three comments, I, the chair is going to take the item off the consent calendar for separate discussion and staff explanation. So is there any further discussion before we proceed to the remaining consent calendar items? Mayor Sellard, I have one, uh, one comment. Um, yes, Mara. So thank you for uh, item 12. I had a comment on that, so I'll save my comments until then. Um, I had a comment on the um, quarterly report uh, for the fire department. And actually it's more of a question. So I'm looking forward to seeing the strategic plan presentation for the police department, but I wanted to ask um, Chief Zane if he's also working on a strategic plan for the fire department. Um, as um, you know, the, the topic of the fire station for Spring Lake comes up very often. It's, it's the concern uh, for residents out here. So I, I wanted to ask if there's a plan in place to look at the strategy moving forward for the delivery system of um, from the fire department to our community at large and specifically for Spring Lake. I would just ask the question if that's a fire chief question or a city manager question. Sure. Mr. Manager, do you have yeah, I'm, I'm happy to respond. And in fact, it is a topic that uh, Chief Zane and I have uh, initiated and we'll be meeting with a consulting firm, uh, I believe later this week, early next week, uh, to outline a scope to update the uh, fire department strategic plan and specifically look at uh, service delivery models, um, as the council has pointed out in their council goals, um, partially to inform future fire facility planning, but also operational planning. So um, absolutely, that'll be something that we'll be focusing on over the next uh, uh, six months and engaging with the public safety subcommittee um, on initial uh, scope, as well as the uh, findings before coming back to council for a report. Thank you. That'll be on Mayor Seller. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Vega. All right, uh, I think we've had a fairly co comprehensive conversation here. I believe we're left with, with uh, items one through 10 on the consent calendar this evening. It's, it's, is, there, is there a motion on the consent? Yes, who's, who's? This is Anna, can you hear me? I have a gentleman raising his hand. Oh, all right. Well, we'll take one more comment then before we proceed to motion. Kevin, can you hear me? Yes, um, is this the time to talk about uh, the H15? I think it's the bicycle pedestrian way. It is not. OK, okay. We'll, we'll come to that later on when we get to that item, sir. We'll now proceed again for a motion for items one through 10, please. Thank Mayor, you. I'll make a motion regarding the items that are left on the consent calendar. Thank you, Council Member Landsberg. Second, please. Second by Mayor Pro Tem Vega. Thank you. We have a motion by Lansburg, second by Vega. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Vega. Aye. Councilmember Fernandez. Aye. Councilmember Garcia Cadena. Aye. Councilmember Landsberg. Aye. Mayor Stallard. Aye. Thank you, colleagues. That concludes uh, the discussion on the consent calendar, but it does leave items 11, 12, and 13. Now, um, uh, we'll take up item uh, uh, 12 first, if that's all right, Mayor uh, Pro Vega. This is the Summertime Fun Club. Uh, I think we better have a full staff report on this, uh, Mr. Manager, to understand what the thinking is and the whys and what the options are for people who cannot afford the new amounts, please, Mr. Manager. Uh, certainly, I'll have Christine actually walk through the... Um... Uh, the full details, but uh, this actually is an action in response to uh, council interest to see if the city could uh, support uh, families in the community with extending uh, hours for summertime camps. Uh, this year, 
Uh, due to the late time frame, we were unable to extend the hours to allow parents um, of uh, children that uh, have a working calendar and need uh, care uh, prior to 8 a.m. in the morning and extending past the current 4 p.m. time frame. So we asked staff to evaluate um, what a uh, extended program in preparation for next summer would look like so that we could build that fee schedule into the uh, rec program guide before it goes to publication later this fall. Um, so Christine and her staff evaluated that and outlined a uh, proposed uh, fee schedule to allow us to stand up a extended summertime camp uh, next year. So uh, with that, Christine, would you mind uh, walking the council through in more detail um, what the action would include and uh, what it means for uh, summer camps next year? Absolutely. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Christine Engel, the Community Services Director. The action that is in front of you this evening is to establish a new fee schedule for a new program that would be offered in addition to the current low-cost program that is already offered. Um, as the city manager indicated, this program would have expanded hours and it would operate from 7.30 in the morning until 5.30 at night compared to the current program and the program that would also be offered from um, that operates from 8 to 4. Um, the action in front of you is to establish a range for a four or five week session and then also the entire nine or 10 week session. And it varies depending on how many weeks of summer are in the Woodland Joint Unified School District uh, summer schedule. So uh, the range for the four to five week program would be between 800 and 975. And then for the entire summer, it would be between 1600 and 1946. What we did is we identified um, the baseline and then we applied a 5% multiplier in order to push us out for five years so we wouldn't have to keep you know, coming back to council to adjust the schedule. Um, the current program is offered at a very low cost at $12.50 a day because there's economies in scale of scale for doing this program. We can have between 150 and 180 kids participate in that program, and it's offered at three parks. With the new program, um, we're anticipating we can have capacity for 60, but we've offered this program in the past and it hasn't stuck. And so that's why we haven't had um, high numbers of enrollment. And that's why we uh, didn't continue to offer it. But conditions have changed in the community and in family dynamics and needs. So we want to try running this program again. However, we uh, costed it assuming that that maybe we would have 30 participants sign up. And we're not actually going to be making revenue in excess of the expenses that we have for the program. Um, in comparison, you know, our program will be $160 a week for the, the 730 to 530 program. Other programs in the community are priced at $225 per week. Um, we really, um, as we go lower in our weekly expense, we're then also competing with the other programs in town that are actually set at the right price point. We just are able to offer the program at a lesser cost. Um, and I think that's about it. I, I realize, you know, upon hearing the comments from the public that maybe it wasn't clear in the report or as clear that as it should have been, that we would then be offering the three regular programs that are super duper low cost and then one new program to help uh, more working families in the community. Christine, could you also come in on scholarship options for people? Oh, absolutely. So um, these summer camp programs are um, cost recovery programs, and we don't use Measure J for these programs. However, we do utilize Measure J funding for scholarships, and we offer $150 scholarships for income qualified families. And those are the families that qualify for the school lunch programs with Woodland Joint Unified School District. So we offer that for swim lessons, lifeguard training, summertime fun club, and our team pack program. Thank you. Uh, uh, colleagues, go ahead, Christine. Oh, I was gonna say that would be $150 per session. So it could actually save a family $300 for the summer. All right. Uh, Council Premier Pro Tem Vega, did you have specific questions? Please proceed. I did. Uh... Christine, thank you so much for that clarification. I also had folks reach out to me with consternation. And uh, as I understood, it was an addition. So uh, absolutely, I'm, I'm glad to have you confirm. Yeah. I 
Um, this is something that I've been really passionate about supporting working families with a schedule that accommodates dual working households. So that added timeframe um, is gonna be extremely helpful. I also just wanna encourage um, city manager to, as we look at ARP funds um, and how we invest in our communities to support childcare, then maybe uh, this is a way to support families who can't afford that additional expense. But um, Christine, from what I hear in the community, your summertime program is, is, is such a blessing uh, for families. It's very much affordable. It is, uh, I think, the most affordable option in town. Um, so I just ask that as enrollment comes up and maybe we do hit that 30, uh, 30 uh, enrollment, uh, student enrollment for that extended program that, that we try to um, maybe make do and accommodate to extend it to as many families as possible. Thank you again. This is a great need. That would be you. nice, Ballard. Uh, thank you, Count uh, Member Tempega. Uh, let me ask if there's any subsequent public comment on this issue now that we've taken it up independently. Madam Clerk? No. Thank you. Any other member of the council wish to comment further on this before we proceed mm -hmm. to Council member Fernandez again. Please, Vicki, go ahead. Thank you, I can't, see, I, I can't see everyone's face at one time on my screen, so I appreciate you speaking up when I don't recognize you. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, just wanted to clarify with the scholarships, is it possible to increase those um the scholarship amount if the fees are increasing for families who can't necessarily afford it? Is that an option or is there a measure to maybe look at increasing the $150? You know, um, I would say absolutely. And that would be something that we would differentiate between the regular program and the ex expanded program that perhaps, you know, instead of the 150, it would be, you know, $200 or 250. We just need to look at the budget for that. Mm -hmm. well, All right. Thank you. Uh, Mayor? Could... Yes, my... Go ahead. Council member uh, Tanya Garcia Cadena. Uh, Christine, thank you very much for the clarification and for the information you provided earlier today. Um, I, um, I wanted to say I appreciate you um, breaking it down and, and bringing this forward. And I would like for us to um, reevaluate the program. I know you said that it, it, we had this, it didn't work, it didn't take, but to use this this um, next summer as kind of a, a trial period and, and see how it works and see um, if we can find some cost cutting um, measures along the way to provide it to more families because as everyone has already stated, childcare is such an issue in our community, especially right now, we're trying to get people back to work and, and um, you know, this pandemic has, has really done a doozy on our community. So I appreciate what you're doing. I would just like us to reevaluate ne after next year. Absolutely. We'll definitely do an evaluation on it. Great. Thank you. Any other council comment tonight? I would just like to say, I think it's pretty clear that all of us on this council care about childcare and the mm -hmm. ability of everybody to have the care they need at a, at a price they can afford. Uh, I would like to say that you know, the city obviously should recover its costs as best it can, particularly from those who have the capacity to pay. Uh, so I think, you know, we should set our fees based on that and then help those who need the extra help. And also, I feel like there are many people providing private child care in our community, and we, we don't want to simply force all the, quote, all the business our direction. We need multiple players in this, service providers in this activity. So I think it's something we all have to be thinking about carefully as we proceed. Uh, is there a motion to approve item 11, please? I will. Mr. Mayor, I have a question before we oh. do that. Okay, Council Member Lansbury. Well, it's, it's procedural. You removed it for further staff report. You want another staff report in writing or just was that sufficient? Oh, that was it. I mean, we can bring it up as like a regular item and have, there is already a staff report in our agenda packet. And I was inviting a staff member to essentially elucidate on the report. All right, uh, do you, in that case, I'm, I'm good. Okay, so we have a, a motion by mm -hmm. Pro Tem Vega to approve item 11. And I think I heard a second, from, but I can't identify who made it. By Tanya, so Tanya made the motion and I, I'd be happy to second it, Mayor Sala. Thank, thank you for the help. You know, mm -hmm. there's a screen in the council chambers I normally rely on, but it's not activated tonight. So I cannot see, uh, three of you most of the time 
Okay. So uh, I with that. I just want to clarify, uh, excuse me, Mayor Stellar, is that item yeah. 12? You said 11, is it 12? Excuse me, it is 12. Thank okay, you for that. Wondering. All right, we're, we're discussing the child care program, summertime program, and we have a motion by Tanya Garcia Cadena, seconded by Myra Vega. Clerk, would you please call the roll? Yes, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Vega? Aye. Councilmember Fernandez? Aye. Councilmember Garcia Cadena? Aye. Council Member Landsberg? Aye. Mayor Stallard? Aye. And I want to again thank the public commenters uh, for expressing their concerns so that we could provide the clarification uh, this evening that has been shared. Uh, we'll keep monitoring this as Council Member Fernandez suggested uh, at, as the program concludes at the end of the summer. So we can do it even better next year if necessary. All right, uh, so we have two more items on the consent calendar. They are 11 and 13. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Vega, I believe you asked for these to be taken from the consent calendar. Did you want to consider them together or independently? Um, let's go ahead and consider them uh, together. They're All right. Yeah. Did you want a staff report on them or would you like to ask questions? Um, I'd like a staff report. So, and my my reason for pulling these is, you know, these are part of the the Spring Lake specific plan, and I've I've had uh, many community members reach out with consternation, you know, wanting clarity around the impacts to the Melaroos and the taxes and the associated infrastructure impacts. So, um, all right, me? that's very fair. If, if people want to know help understand better. We're all about that. So Mr. Ma Manager, would you please proceed to describe items 11 and 13 and why these actions are before us tonight? Yeah, happy to and appreciate uh, Mayor Pro Tem Vega uh, pulling this item because uh, some of these procedural things on our end seem sort of standard and, uh, you know, uh, regular course of action and can certainly respect uh, particularly residents in Spring Lake wanting to know specifically how this might affect, um, you know, their lives, the, the specific plan uh, out in Spring Lake, as well as the, um, the fees that they pay. I've asked Brent Meyer to uh, respond uh, in more detail to some of the, the technicalities of what these actions are, but essentially at a high level, both of these, these projects, the, the reimbursement agreements for the Spring Lake Central um, project, as well as Beagley Ranch, are agreements that the city entered into with the developers of those projects uh, for them to, uh, in exchange for building their houses, um, complete infrastructure that was identified as part of the Spring Lake plan. Um, and as they complete those pieces of infrastructure, the agreements uh, obligate the city to reimburse them for their cost. Uh, and those costs are uh, covered uh, for the SLIF improvements uh, from the bond payments um, that were issued. Uh, both of these projects um, are projects that were previously identified as um, being eligible for bond uh, payment reimbursement. Uh, they were not uh, contemplated as part of the, the recent bond uh, direction that the council gave. So these are part of a, a prior series of bonds that were issued. Um, so I'll have Brent uh, walk through in a little bit more detail about what these actions are, and then we can come back and speak to, um, you know, how this ultimately will translate, uh, if at all, to any uh, changes in a uh, Spring Lake residence tax bill. Hello, uh, good evening, Council. Um, so, item number eleven is uh, the Spring Lake Central Development. Excuse me. This is broken. Okay. Well, uh, take yeah, off the consent account and bring up my phone. Sorry about that. We have technical challenges here in the board, in the council chambers. I apologize for the interruption. Proceed. Okay, so item number eleven is for um, the Parkland Avenue extension project, um, and so uh, this was part of the larger Spring Lake Central development. And uh, sorry, I don't have a graphic showing this, but Parkland Avenue um, is kind of in the middle of Spring Lake, and it's an extension that will eventually go over uh, one thirteen. And then um, some of it included in the reimbursement is portions of Harry Lorenzo Avenue. Um, so one of the things to uh, remind council also is that this, the, the developer doesn't get paid, repaid for all infrastructure. They just get repaid for or reimbursed for major infrastructure. So Pioneer Avenue, uh, Heritage Parkway, 
Parkland, um, sound walls on those major streets, County Road 25A, a lot of what we call intract, um, the local streets uh, going up to their houses, there's no reimbursement for that. And when we say reimbursement, they pay fees uh, at building permits uh, to pay for that. Some of those they do uh, transfer to homeowners through the Melarus uh, laws. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so that's Spring Lake um, Central. Um, and then, uh, which I believe is Richmond American or next to Richmond American Homes. The other one is uh, what we call Beagley Multifamily. This is at the corner of Parkland and Marston. Um, this is actually a fairly small reimbursement. It's just the sound walls that are on Parkland Avenue because the rest of the infrastructure was already built out by previous developers. Um, and so uh, just so happens that the sound walls are included in that SLIF reimbursement, um, but everything else on site to the development is not reimbursable. Um, and so, um, and then along with Beagley, the other thing is uh, what we would consider, let's see, is this is a um, uh, related stream like reimbursement. So it's also a final map. So the final map process uh, for development is that if a developer meets all their previous requirements that were approved by the planning commission, uh, it actually is what creates buildable lots. And so this action creates 75 buildable lots. Uh, the developer has paid a number of different types of fees uh, in, in terms of getting this. They have to bond for all the infrastructure to create um, uh, access to each of those properties, the water, the sewer, storm drainage, um, and private utilities also. And in agreement, the city agrees to give them um, the individual lots that they can then, upon project completion and building completion, sell to individual homeowners. So that's kind of the bigger picture of what the final map process is. Um, so anyway, so those are um, the SLIF reimbursements. So um, as, as Ken, I think, alluded to a little bit, so um, this doesn't impact uh, additional Mellow Roost payments. So bonding was already completed. Uh, there is cash on hand to pay these reimbursements. So this action itself doesn't necessarily create additional uh, mellow roost burden for homeowners um, because it's already included in the bond that's, that was bonds that were sold a few months ago. Um, I think there was also a question about L and L fees. Um, so the, um, uh, the Beagley one doesn't really create an L and L fee. The Parkland is a road and adjacent to the road is green belts. And so there are some additional costs related to the maintenance of um, the green belt there. And I think there's a median landscaping also. Uh, generally, though, what we have is, you know, we build these projects. Uh, they come in with houses. Houses pay the, the l and So we add more houses that those costs are distributed across, and then we add more improvements, too. And so generally speaking, unless we have like a, a park project or something that adds a lot of cost, um, Generally speaking, there isn't necessarily a change in the L and L because you're you're bringing up the houses that tend to lower the L and L along with the improvements that would tend to uh, raise the L and L, and so those two, generally speaking, go hand in hand, and the L and L should be generally speaking the same. Uh, there might be minor fluctuations in the L and L if there was a lot of houses built and less improvements, or if there was less houses and a lot more improvements. Um, but generally speaking, those two things go hand in hand. Um, and there's a little change to the L and L, other than major structural issues like cost of water, cost of staff, or a park or something like that. Construction of a large improvement like a park. So, does that answer questions? Any uh, any other clarification or clarification or questions? Brent, you you use the SLIF. Can you remind us what that acronym is? I'm sorry. Staff throws around these terms all the time. Uh, Spring Lake Infrastructure Financing plan. And so what that is, generally speaking, is a, is a per house fee that the developers pay. It's about $50,000. And a portion of that gets financed through uh, Mellow Roos and is sent is basically kind of given to the homeowners as a burden through their Mellow Roos payments. And that's in the range of twenty dollars to $25,000 that's then reimbursed or paid for by the homeowners. Thank you. Yeah, it's awful bit soup with these uh, acronyms. You clarifying that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Council Member Vega, if I could just uh, clarify. So once, say, parkland improvements um, are completed and accepted by the city, uh, developer gets uh, reimbursed for their costs. The city then takes over maintenance of uh, the landscape improvements, uh, the street lighting, uh, the roadway itself, um, and uh, the utilities underneath it. Uh, the landscaping and lighting assessment district was set up in Spring Lake such that the uh, L and L would cover the cost for maintenance of the landscaping, uh, the path, the street lights, uh, the entire roadway surface is a city obligation as well as all the uh, storm drain, sewer, water underneath the roadway. So uh, those are city obligations. Uh, the landscaping uh, and the lighting uh, effectively are part of the L and L uh, that is covered by the residents in Spring Lake. Okay, thank you. And um, Ken, I do have a question around the, the LNL and the assessment and the increases. I had a resident reach out to me with the question around whether or not those are subject to Prop 218. Can you speak to that? Um, yeah, I'll actually have Ethan Walsh speak to that. I believe uh, you know the 218 process does not apply to uh, the Landscaping and Lighting Assessment District uh, after it is initially formed. Um, but maybe Mr. Walsh, our legal counsel, can speak uh, more specifically to that. So, so it 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 applies to to two eighteen to the degree that um, that we need to you know it needs to be um, it's a proper it, it's a property related fee and it has to be reasonably related to the cost of the service that we're providing. But it's not subject to voter requirements like like some Prop two eighteen fees are. Okay, so does it have to go out to vote before we can increase or make a change in, in the tax burden to the resident? Right, right, right. It's an assessment, and so it has to be reasonably related to the, basically to the benefit that the homeowner gets from being in the district, but it does not have to go, it's not a, it's not a tax that has to be voted on. Okay. But Ethan, those assessment amounts were established at the front end of the Spring Lake development, correct? With escalators built in. Uh, so the, the overall max amount of that landscaping and lighting assessment district was determined at that time with uh, some cost inflators over time. Right, I believe, I believe so. And that's a proper way to set up a, a, a lighting and landscaping district. Any additional questions, Myra? No, um, that'll be it. And I believe we have public comment uh, that was submitted for these items. I also yeah. have a question. Uh, well, we'll proceed with council questions first and then we'll go to public comment. Uh, council member Garcia Cadena. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So um, in regards to 13, I'm looking at the subdivision improvement agreement for completion of public improvements. And as I look down here, D says developer has not completed all of the work. Is that a typo or because I thought we were accepting this as having been completed? Sorry, this is uh, number 13, which is Beagley. Yes. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm sorry. 11 has been completed, 13 is not. And so uh 13 so what this is is it's the beginning of the project beginning of construction so the developer puts uh puts up bonds and so because it hasn't been completed and those bonds guarantee that the work will be completed and so um so in this some developers do it you know at the beginning or at the end uh spring lake central uh you know their reimbursement normally would have happened before they built all the improvements but they came in afterwards uh, with Beagley, it's more typical that final map happens before all the improvements are done. And uh, they, the, it says they're not done because what they're doing is they're putting up bonds. And then if they don't follow through with the completion of the infrastructure, that the city has the ability to take those bonds and, and exercise the bonds and, and build the work ourselves. That rarely happens, but um, that is essentially the city's guarantee and typically happens with the final map. Okay, thank you for that the question. Yes, thank you. Any additional council comment or question before I go for public comment? Madam Clerk, please uh, air the public comment. Mayor Stellard, I don't have any for item uh, 
11 or 13. My next items are related to item 15 and 17. All right. Um, we're not seeing anybody calling in either. No, I don't see anybody raising their hand. All right. If that's the case, then uh, Mr. Mr. Walsh, can we take items 11 and 13 as a single vote or must they be separate votes now? Yeah, you, it, it's at your discretion. If someone makes a motion to approve both, you can do it by a single motion. Thank you. I would, I would ask the council for a motion to approve items 11 and 13. Mayor Sellard, I'll make the motion to approve items 11 and 13. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Vega. Is there a second, please? I, I will second those, uh, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Garcia Cadena. We have motion by Vega, second by Garcia Cadena to approve items 11 and 13. Without further discussion, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Vega. Aye. Council Member Fernandez. Aye. Council Member Garcia Cadena. Aye. Council Member Landsberg. Aye. Mayor Stallard. Aye. Thank you. Well, that concludes our consent calendar. <laughs> Took a while tonight, but those were excellent discussions. So I'm glad we could have them. I apologize for my failure to turn off my mic during the technical problems. All right, uh, we now then move on to public hearings. Item 14 is the uh, mitigated negative declaration for the storm drainage outfall channel outlet structure project. This is an environmental review issue. Uh, Mr. Manager. Uh, yeah, I'll have uh, our utilities engineer, uh, Tim Bush, do the presentation on this one. But uh, as the mayor introduced, this is an environmental um, uh, report pertaining to uh, environmental analysis performed for the city's outfall uh, project, uh, which is a critical piece of the city's infrastructure that effectively takes all of the city's uh, urban runoff uh, and discharges it into the bypass uh, through the bypass levy. So that's a project that we've been working on for several years and going through the state and federal permitting process. Uh, this environmental document is necessary for us to complete prior to uh, finalizing project design and going to project bid. Uh, so I'll have uh, Mr. Bush walk the council through uh, this item. Uh, it is a public hearing, so we'll take public comments um, afterwards before uh, having council take action. Tim. Hi, good evening, Mayor. Uh, my name is Mark Miller, I'm an associate engineer working with Tim Bush. Uh, You're better looking. Go ahead. <laughs> hey, so Mayor, uh, calling in under his name tonight, but uh, he is here with me and we can take any questions you may have. Uh, as uh, the city manager alluded to, this project is uh, concerning three culverts in the outfall channel, uh, which runs east of town, just north of County Road 22. Uh, all of the city's storm drainage and a portion of the county's storm drainage flows uh, through that channel and discharges into the Yolo Bypass through three metal culverts. And uh, these culverts are past their uh, useful life. They've exceeded it. Uh, even one has uh, collapsed and um, so the project that's in front of you for uh, environmental approval tonight is um, we are proposing to replace those three culverts with one multi-cell concrete box culvert. And uh, that new culvert will accommodate the city's storm drainage portion of the counties, and it will meet uh, the current urban levy criteria uh, for culverts through levies. So uh, in front of you is the approval of the environmental document the city has completed its initial study um, on the project's potential environmental effects. And um, we've circulated a mitigated negative declaration for more than 30 days of public review. We received two comments, um, but none were substantial, none required substantial changes to the initial study. And um, so now in front of you is the adoption of the notice of declaration that um, the project will have minimal environmental impacts as long as we mitigate for, uh, for some of the temporary and uh, permanent uh, impacts that the project will have. So. Thank you. That was a succinct and to the point presentation uh, for, for the benefit of our community. This is how we evacuate water when we have heavy downpours. 
which we hope someday we'll have again. And uh, we got to get that water out of town so we don't flood our streets and roads. So anyway, that's what we're talking about here today. Uh, is there any council comment before I open the public hearing? All right. I, I've just opened the public hearing. Is there anybody who wishes to comment on, on this item relative to the negative declaration for the storm drainage outfall channel outlet structure project? Madam Clerk? No, I don't have any emails or voicemails or no, nobody is raising their hand. There being no public comment this evening on the item, I'm closing the public hearing and returning to the council to hopefully approve the item. Is there a motion, please? We can be here a long time if you guys don't jump in with a motion. <laughs> Landsberg will move it. Fernandez moves, Landsberg seconds. Madam Aye. Clerk, please call the roll. <clears throat> the Mayor Pro Tem Vega. Aye. Councilmember Fernandez. Aye. Councilmember Garcia Cadena. Aye. Councilmember Lansberg. Aye. Mayor Stallard. Aye. Thank you, colleagues. All right, that concludes public hearings for the night. We move on. We move along to item H, report to the <laughs> city manager. The first is item 15, the construction contract for sports park drive pedestrian overcrossing project, which has been before us previously. Mr. Manager, please update us. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council. Uh, this item is to have the council consider uh, awarding a construction con contract, which would um, be the final action for us to move forward with constructing a uh, bike and pedestrian only bridge that would connect uh, the southeast area part of the community to uh, the west part of the community uh, and is a, a critical piece of bike and pedestrian infrastructure uh, that would link uh, via the uh, general plans identified Woodland Parkway project that ultimately would be a class one bike facility uh, connecting uh, the entire community from County Road 102 over to County Road 98. Um, so yeah, Brent, can you mute? I think it might be coming from, there we go. Uh, so uh, this project um, would typically show up on a consent calendar when we go out to bid for a project that's um, been a project in the works for a while. Uh, we'd have on consent uh, award of a project like this, but uh, given the bid results that we got back, which were um, higher than uh, our engineer's estimate uh, and substantially higher, we felt it appropriate to have a uh, presentation to the council regarding uh, the result of those bids, um, potential funding option for uh, us to move forward with the project, should the council be comfortable doing so. Uh, before I hand it over to Brent to, to walk you through the, the project details again and the proposed funding, uh, I do want to acknowledge that this project is um, a critical piece of the general plan uh, update process where we received uh, tremendous feedback um, from the community, uh, ranking bike and pedestrian um, Friendliness is one of the top uh, priorities for our general plan uh, for the next 25 years and to be able to connect communities uh, better uh, using bike and pedestrian facilities. It's been a council priority goal um, for the last three or four uh, council goal um, sessions um, and is, uh, I think, touches on several uh, priority aspects in those goals, whether it be environmental, uh, quality life, healthy communities. So uh, it's an important project, uh, however, um, uh, the bid results that, that uh, came back give us um, a caution to say before we, we move forward with this project, uh, is this the right uh, time? Is this the right funding solution? So uh, the action requested before you this evening, um, based on staff's analysis, uh, is to move forward with the project and allocate additional funding uh, necessary to, to fill the funding gap for the project from the city's development uh, impact fee program, specifically in the roadway category. Uh, that fund program um, is a program that has uh, this project identified uh, as part of its uh, funding. Uh, these funds are not funds that could otherwise go towards the maintenance of uh, existing roadway facilities. So it's not money that we can use for maintenance of uh, some of the roads uh, throughout the community. Rather, it's, it's funding specifically set aside for uh, addressing uh, future growth and capacity um, uh, needs or uh, mitigating capacity impacts as a result of future growth. So uh, with that, I will uh, have Brent walk you through the presentation and look forward to the council discussion. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Thank Brent. You, Mr. Manager. Brent. Okay. Let me do my share screen here. And get 
get this thing set up. Okay. Uh, is the slideshow showing up here? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, good. Okay, so this is the Sports Park Drive Pedestrian Overcrossing Project. So uh, here below is the uh, approximate project limits. Uh, as you can see on the west side of 113, uh, the project landing is at Metmore Road and Sports Park Drive. And on the east side, it's at uh, the west side of Spring Lake Park, um, or partially the future of Spring Lake Park. Um, as Ken mentioned, this does provide a significant connectivity. Um, so we have a separated off-street path uh, with this project. Uh, we'll have a separated off-street path from County Road 102 all the way to East Street. That's two miles. Um, and then the future plan is this, this would then get extended from East Street to Ashley Avenue. Um, and then from there, it provides this east-west corridor um, would then connect to existing north-south uh, corridors, bike lane corridors on north-south streets. Uh, so I pretty significant. You, have, you don't have a slide. Brent, uh, this is Jay. I'm sorry. I think you might be sharing your wrong screen. We have technical problems. We uh, have technical problems. Can you see the project rendering? No, we're still looking at the no, first. We're still looking at the first. Oh, okay. Okay, so I'm moving it around. You guys are still on the first screen. We are. We are. Okay, Good. that's too bad. It's hard to follow your talking about. Follow your talking about. Now you're moving through the slide. Now you're moving through the slide. And I'm getting an echo. Okay. And I'm getting an echo. Yeah, I am sorry about that echo. Um. Okay, can you see the second slide? Or not, not the title? Limit. Okay. Yes. Yes, we can see it. Yes, we can see it. Okay. Scott, you might want to stick around. Um, okay, so this, uh, so this connects to north-south uh, streets with existing bike lane infrastructures. The next one, can you see the project rendering? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, Okay, I might um, have to escape and push this. I'll do one yeah. slide at a time. Can you see the project rendering now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is an earlier graphic. We actually have one less span on the east side. Uh, so at completion is the rough graphic. Uh, uh, so the west side will connect to Matmore Road, east side to Spring Lake Park, as we already discussed. Uh, the west side landing is located adjacent to land owned by Woodland Christian School. Um, and so we'll actually have a security fence uh, at the bottom of the slope uh, to keep the public off of Woodland Christian School's property and uh, Woodland Christian School from directly accessing the park. So uh, as they have security needs. Um, so that is that. Um, uh, can you see that slide or the slide I just moved to? Probably not. Bid results. Oh, you can. Okay. Bridge elevation and design. Can you see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so project aesthetics. We wanted to have project aesthetics in mind for this project. So um, at the uh, abutments and the columns, we'll have pilasters. We'll have the post stop light that's um, throughout Spring Lake. For lighting and then a deck ornamental metal uh, wire mesh fence um, uh, is included with the the bid package. Um, the fence was one of the items that was significantly expensive so uh, we'll be talking with the contractor to see if we can do something a little different but we still want to have something uh, that's a nice looking amenity for the community. Okay um, can you see Oh, there's a missing slide. Okay, um, so want to talk a little bit about schedule. I'm sorry, uh, we have the wrong slide here, but schedule. Um, so the idea is that we start construction uh, in the next month. Uh, the bridge abutments uh, then get built, uh, which is the, the earthen foundation. Um, and then um, 
that gets built this fall. And then there's a 90 day waiting period um, for that uh, abutment to settle. And then, so the idea is that happens during the winter when that construction can't happen. And then next spring, the bridge uh, work basically starts in earnest and then the bridge is built from the spring until the fall of 2021. Um, and then, or 2022, excuse me. And then that links into the Spring Lake Park construction, which will be uh, under construction in kind of the latter half of 2022. So hopefully, Fall of 2022, we'll have a new bridge constructed, uh, assuming council moves forward with this project, with awarding this, and then we'll also have um, the park constructed, and so that'll be a nice completed path uh, from the park over the freeway. Um, I would say uh, thanks for Woodland Christian School. Uh, we have had a ton of coordination issues between uh, the city, uh, the nearby developer and Woodland Christian School putting all the agreements together and they have met many times with me at a moment's notice. Um, I mean, we are, we are probably at the last council meeting to make this plan work uh, and they've been instrumental in helping this thing move forward. Uh, there's a question whether we'd even be able to keep the current schedule we have if we moved into September. Um, so bid results. So unfortunately, uh, fortunately, we had five bidders, so we were, were pretty confident about what the price is for this project because we had uh, a, a good uh, response to the bid. Um, uh, fortunately, we had a low bid. Excuse me? Can you put that slide up with the bid, please? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, let me make sure I have that one up. There you go. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Okay. So bid results. Um, so we did have five bidders. So that's certainly an indication that we had a good bid environment. The low bidder was uh, significantly lower than number two. And then two through five is what we would generally see as a good distribution. Uh, so we're, uh, even though this is a bid that is higher than what we were expecting, certainly higher than an engineer's estimate from a year ago, um, I, I do believe this is, uh, you know, kind of where the market is today and probably where the market will be in the future as we're especially looking at additional uh, federal government funding for infrastructure. Um, the two things about a bridge that make it probably more expensive than the average road project is steel. There's definitely been a shortage of steel and, and a bridge project uh, uses more rebar. Um, and steel for other things within the bridge. Uh, and then the other thing, the concrete itself is not necessarily, uh, from at least the wording we've heard is, um, concrete is not necessarily in short supply, but to build the concrete, there's a lot of wood form work. Um, and our understanding is that there is a shortage of supply for wood. And so generally, if you look through the bid results, the item by item results, most of the items are within you know, either at engineer's estimate, 10, 15% over, pretty close to engineer's estimate. Um, but we had two or three items that were significantly above. And so steel pilings was about 74% high. So that represents the, the price of the steel. Uh, the bridge concrete, which talked about that's related to the wood, um, that was 47% high. And then the pedestrian railing, which we're going to see if there's going to be an, uh, if there's an alternative that we can get that would be cheaper, um, that's uh, almost two and a half times higher than engineer's estimate. Now, there's nothing golden about the engineer's estimate. It's the best guess from the engineer. Um, but what we really saw from this bid was a lot of items that were around engineer's estimate, maybe 10, 15 percent, which is reflective of the current bidding prices. Gas prices are higher. That affects most prices across the board. Um, labor is, you know, harder to get a hold of, so that affects most prices across the board. But it's really a, a, a case of two or three items, four items being, you know, significantly more um, money. And and we we were able to see across the board all five bids. Um, they they had similar bids on these individual items that were higher than normal. Um, so in talking with both design consultant, CM consultant, and just the experience we have from bidding other projects, we don't feel uh, that this project will necessarily be cheaper or less expensive next year. There's a number of things that are 
kind of set up so that it would be problematic to delay, such as uh, we, we piled the earthwork for the bridge abutments in Spring Lake Park. And so there would be additional costs of either delaying that project or moving that soil off site. Um, so um, that, you know, we, we really coordinated a number of things to make this happen now. And so it, it, there, there are some costs that the city would have to uh, take on if we decide to not move forward with the project. Brian, did, um, so you the next slide, did, did you have a slide that actually said the slide that actually said the uh, I'm sorry. So can you did repeat you have that? A slide that actually yeah. itemizes yeah. the cost yeah. of the yeah. source of funds. Uh, okay. So the next one, sorry, um, the funding is the current slide. Can you see the project funding slide? No. No. Okay. Let me uh, pull that up. And I apologize. For this, Thank I will. It now. It now. Okay, so um, let's walk through these. So capital projects funding actually represents a number of things. So this is uh, individual project development agreements with Spring Lake developers, where we required them to pay extra money towards this project and and another specific project. Some it was specifically called out the pet overcrossing. Uh, some we were kind of more generic that it's other projects that the city chooses. Um, and, uh, and then as well as some transit money, um, uh, we've had discussions with the uh, transit district um, and we've come up with a situation where they have other funds to purchase buses. We have been collecting money in Spring Lake to purchase buses and they essentially said, hey, we have other funding to do that. You can go ahead and do that on a similar improvement. We felt an appropriate improvement would be uh, a bicycle and pedestrian non-auto related improvement. Um, and so um, so that and that funding is not, uh, I referred earlier to SLIF funding. It's not funding related to the SLIF or the Melarus. It's just additional funding that we required Spring Lake developers to pay. Uh, we also required um, non-Spring Lake developers to pay. There's a development south of the mall site that had to pay uh, additional funds as part of a development agreement. One of those was related to not widening E Street to four lanes. And we said we'd rather have that money go towards this improvement, the pedestrian overcrossing, as a way of emphasizing and supporting bicycle and pedestrian improvements. Um, so that's kind of the catch-all for all those different funds that we required of the developer. Give some ranch infrastructure funding. So uh, this is the uh, specific plan that's north of Gibson and west of 102. Um, this project was built out mostly in the 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, we built out all of the projects that were in the approved capital improvement plan for that specific plan. And at the end, we had one, well, almost $1.5 million left over. Uh, we looked at the original funding and it allowed for uh, funding of a pedestrian overcrossing. And so we used that, we added that money to this project. There were very few other projects that we could add that to. We inquired about using it for the fire station, not an eligible expense. Um, so there were, there, this was the only project, quite frankly, we could come up with. Um, in addition, road development funding. So I'm showing here 2.1 million. Um, 500,000 of that is already in the budget. 1.6 million is additive to the budget um, as part of tonight's council action if we move forward with the project. Uh, as Ken mentioned earlier, road development funding is for capacity increasing funding only. It's paid citywide, not specific in Spring Lake. So all development within the city pays towards this fund. Um, and it's only for capacity improvement improvements such as signals, road widening, interchange expansions, and projects like the pedestrian overcrossing. It cannot be used uh, for road maintenance or road rehab. Um, and then water enterprise funding was also added with this latest update. Uh, there were impacts of uh, additional costs to the pet overcrossing from the presence of the uh, water transmission main right next to it. Um, and so that's the reason for that funding added. Um, any questions about that? Uh, colleagues, we do have some public comments. Shall we go to public comment? Shall we go to public comment before questions? Well, questions? I'm sorry, I do I, I, I do have more in my presentation. I'm not sure if you'd want me to finish the presentation. 
I just knew there was lots of questions about project funding. All right, well, All right, colleague, well questions at this point. Questions at this point. It, it, does somebody in your shop does have in your shop have why this, this, why this echo? Somebody somewhere. Somebody somewhere. At this meeting playing in the background. Playing in the background. Uh, anyway. Tom, this is Jay. I actually think the, the audio loop is coming from Brent himself. So whenever he's talking, it's coming from there. Let's see if we can't fix that before he reports to our council at a future meeting, please. All right. <clears throat> council members, questions on this project so far? Shall we continue with the presentation? Mayor Sollard, I have some questions about the uh, the fees collected from the Spring Lake um, developers. Can So I see in the notes that it's... Um, they're not part of the Spring Lake infrastructure or Melrose funding, but can um, Brent or Ken explain, you know, what parameters um, were placed on the fees collected from the Spring Lake developers? Because just kind of what, I, what I'm thinking is, is there, are we taking away from a Spring Lake specific project um, or amenity um, to, to fund um, this project? Can you talk about that? Yeah, happy to take a stab at it and Brent can fill in. So um, about four years ago, when uh, the housing market started to pick back up, uh, there was some capacity and we kept asking developers that were coming in for uh, entitlement in Spring Lake and outside of Spring Lake, if as part of their required development agreements, if they would contemplate uh, paying an additional per unit um, supplemental payment to the city to go towards um, community amenities that weren't already uh, anticipated within our uh, capital programs or fully funded in those capital programs. So uh, we had a discretionary opportunity because um, we were granting uh, some entitlements to these projects to, to ask for that. So in those development agreements, um, you know, we reached um, you know, terms with, with these projects to have them make supplemental payments. As Brent mentioned, uh, some of the Spring Lake projects, uh, there was uh, specifically uh, an item called out for contributions to the pedestrian and bike overcrossing project. Um, and then supplementally, there was uh, a community um, benefit um, payment uh, that was requested, which is much more flexible. This, the city council certainly does have discretion over how to allocate those funds. Um, we intentionally identified the bike and pedestrian overcrossing project um, as part of these uh, because it is an amenity that isn't part of the Spring Lake infrastructure financing plan. There wasn't sufficient funding to complete that project. It was taken out back in the 2008 timeframe uh, from the city's CIP program. Uh, and I believe there might've been some, some Spring Lake funding at one point identified, um, but it was amenity that we heard um, repeatedly when we were uh, meeting with Spring Lake residents uh, around 2014, amenity that they wanted to see uh, built. And so um, when these developers started coming in asking for entitlements, we started asking them to contribute towards the project. Um, and uh, so that the funding that you see there under those capital projects funding is uh, a compilation of probably six different projects uh, for which these development agreements included additional payments um, uh, to the uh, the various projects, but most namely the, the bike and pedestrian overcrossing. So uh, those funds could also be used uh, for a, a swimming pool, fire station, um, or other amenities. Um, and uh, again, we felt appropriate to, uh, to target this project to leverage the other funding that we already had available uh, and also respond to the, the residents' request to get this project built so that they could access uh, not just the senior uh, center and, and sports park, but also the rest of the community safely and not have to navigate uh, Gibson Road or Pioneer and get up to Gum Avenue. So um, does that answer your question, uh, Mayor Pertain Vega? It does. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, any additional questions? Resume the presentation. Please proceed, Brent. Okay. So project funding, can you see that slide? Yes, we have. Oh, sorry. Yes, we have. Okay, sorry. Next is project budget. So here's the breakdown of the project budget. Uh, project management and design costs are in the range of $900,000. Right of way is just short of 
uh, $500,000. Um, I would note the right of way itself was probably less than that. There were a number of items that we, as part of the right of way agreement, we asked Woodland Christian to construct instead of the city, such as the fence uh, along the property line. Uh, construction including 5% contingencies, 5.4 million, and construction management is just above $700,000 for a total cost of about $7.6 million. Next I would slide. say the soft costs on this project, so that's project management, design, construction management, are a little more expensive uh, than typical uh, because this is considered specialty work. Uh, this is not the, the inspectors and designers of these projects uh, are more bridge structural background. And so uh, that is, we are paying a little bit more because of the specialty nature of their training and work. Um, and then from that slide is, uh, the last slide city council direction. Is that, can you see that one? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, good. Um, so, uh, staff's recommendation is to, uh, award the bid and proceed with construction. Uh, but I understand there are questions and concerns about this project and the funding and the cost of it. Uh, so if there are concerns from council, we're, we're open to uh, hearing those, discussing those. Okay. So with Thank that uh, presentation. Thank you, Thank you Brent. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'd like to take a public comment like before we have a council discussion on this without objection. So Madam Clerk, can you play the, uh, or read the, the input received on this item? Yes, I also have a, Kevin, can you, can you hear me? Kevin, you're raising your hand. Is this for item 15? Yes. Okay. Let, please let Kevin proceed then. Um, I, overall, I, I, as a community member in Spring Lake, I, I think the idea seems pretty great and it's definitely something I would use if it was there. My concerns are primarily that in every city I've ever lived in, um, these overpasses become uh, transit ways for a criminal element. It's, it's just the only way I've ever seen it go. For a certain few, for a few hours of a day, it'll be used by cyclists, it'll be used by joggers. And then uh, a, a later portion of the day, it's uh, an unmitigated highway for travel. So I'm wondering what, um, what things are being done to mitigate any safety concerns to prevent uh, Spring Lake from getting dumpster fires. Um, the other concern I have is um, if part of the rush is to beat out government spending uh, conceivably through any kind of uh, future infrastructure plans or whatnot. Uh, I think of it as, as Woodland is the government. Woodland would be the spending party in addition to maybe the county or some federal, but in some ways that's trying to get ahead and beat ourselves at funding future work. Um, Included in that is like looking at the low bid that you have. The low bid is is underbid by seven hundred and twenty-two thousand dollars. That's a, quite a bit of concern, I would think. That's a fourteen percent off of the uh, next highest bid, twenty-five percent off the highest bid. That leaves quite a bit of ground for error. Um, I this is a hard one for me to decide on, but um, I'm just throwing out those those concerns to you that um, safety. Uh, particularly when several other callers into this meeting have voiced safety concern, concerns throughout Woodland, and then buying it in a time that has exorbitant costs. Um, this is not buying in a sale. This is buying during a disaster. So um, just some things to really take to heart. Thanks for, uh, thanks for hearing, uh, hearing me. Excuse me. Uh, thank you for your input, Mr. Coward. Madam Clerk, we're going to read the other input, please. Yes, thank you. I have an email from Ginny Wagner. Listed below are my reasons why the City of Woodland should complete the pedestrian walkway. I was part of the original committee who created the idea because many people in Woodland had requested the walkway. The Spring Lake plan that was created specifies that the residents of Woodland want more trails and locations to walk, run, or ride a bicycle. It was a huge complaint when the Spring Lake plan was created in or about 2006. Everyone used Davis as an example where you can walk, run, or ride a bicycle without dodging the cars. Two, the walkway would help the connection of the east and west side of Woodland. 
Three, it would give the kids of Woodland a place to ride their bikes that was safe from the crazy drivers of Woodland. Four, it would also increase the values of the Woodland residents' homes because we have additional resources for the residents to enjoy. Five, to remove it would be a huge mistake for the residents of Woodland as there are more, multiple requests during the pl planning of Spring Lake and many of the individuals on the committee were speaking on behalf of all of Woodland. And six, money was allocated during the planning stages for this walkway. Sincerely, Ginny Wagner. And then I have a voice, uh, an email message from Brian Coward and it's a two part. The first part- oh, is Mr. Coward has spoken uh, himself tonight. Oh, okay. That was who's- uh, so we'll presume his Mayor, comment. Mayor okay. Sellard, um, that was not, that was Kevin who spoke. Um, oh. Mr. Coward did not speak. I apologize. Thank you for the clarification. Proceed to share Mr. Coward's remarks. Okay, and and um, I'm gonna just read the remarks uh, pertinent to item 15. I'll come back later for item 17. Um, I am writing in regard to agenda items 15. Um, I am concerned about the city's choices to prioritization these projects before other more critical Spring Lake infrastructure and financing issues are addressed. The pedestrian overcrossing will be a nice addition to access the sports park, which is unfortunately a Spring Lake park. This park does not serve Spring Lake residents in a way a neighborhood park is intended. It's located on the west side of State Route 113, while 90% of Spring Lake is on the east side of State Route 113. Spring Lake is being financially burdened in the construction and lighting and landscaping costs for this regional park, which has never received any input from Spring Lake residents on its design. In the fiscal impact portion of this item, it states the capital projects funding is provided through various fees approved in project development agreements. The fees are collected as building permits are issued for the Spring Lake and mall expansion site developments. How many other neighborhood parks in Woodland require building a nearly $8 million pedestrian bridge to access it? We should take a step back from this project, discuss how to correct the incongruities that have occurred in the sports park not serving Spring Lake and reevaluate our finances and infrastructure needs. And I think we have two voicemail messages, one or two. Jay. The voicemail messages are on uh, items 15, 16, and 17. This is item 15, Jay. 15, oh, okay, Jay. gotcha. All right, here's the uh, first message right now. They're actually speaking, they're speaking on multiple, uh, the multiple items. It's only a few seconds for each item. Okay. Hello, well, let's my hear. name is Jennifer Owens and uh, appreciate the opportunity to leave a comment. Louder. Uh, my comments relate to section H, uh, I'll item 15, 16, and 17. Under uh, section 15, just wanted to make the public comment that I am very pleased to see this work moving forward. Um, it's a long time coming and we are really happy to see progress. Um, it looks like uh, an award to a construction company and, and breaking ground and getting this going. Under section 16, um, the proposed annexation of different areas. In okay, the maybe you can stop it there since I'm we not sure it wasn't clear. Uh, are you commenting, um, Council Mayor Pro Tem Vega? Oh, I was just suggesting that suggesting that we cut the voicemail to item 15 since we heard that maybe replay the 16th at a later date. I realized she looped the three in. All right. Well, I thought we might as well hear all of it because. Okay. Sorry. Fair enough. Sorry. Yeah, they're, they're all kind of smooshed together. It's really hard to break up. Let's hear it all because we're taking up 15 now. So we need to hear what she had to say about 15. We'll hear what she said about the other ones as well. Okay, please from the um, agenda, but it looks like perhaps the sports park is one of those areas, which I would be much in favor of it being part of overall city of Woodland instead of the burden of just Spring Lake residents, um, requiring them to unfairly pay for the upkeep um, and have a financial burden in our property tax lighting and landscaping. So I hope that that's what the proposal is about. If so, I'm very much in favor. Or, um, the area of section 17 uh, related to the uh, proposal for the um, second public uh, community pool. 
Um, a couple of thoughts. Number one, I am interested to see more about the financing of the pool because I have very strong feelings that the pool should not be coming out of the Mellow Roof dollars uh, from the Spring Lake community, but funds should be found through the general fund uh, since it will be an entire community amenity. Um, and similarly, I want to make sure that the operating uh, funds for that uh, amenity will not be unfairly burdened onto the Spring Lake community as the sports park has been. So I'm very much in favor of adding an amenity like that, assuming that it is not um, coming at the cost of badly needed infrastructure in the Spring Lake area that really needs to be addressed through the Melrose dollars. Thank you for the consideration and um, I look forward to learning more. Next, please. Uh, the, next, the next voicemail is for items of 15 and 17. Go ahead and play the whole thing, please. Hi, this is Tony Smith. I live on Somerset in Spring Lake, and I'm concerned about two things that you're talking about tonight. One is the pool, because I'm really, of course we want the pool, but I need to know how it's being paid for. And also the pedestrian because I just feel that Spring Lake community is paying for things that are used by the entire city, um, like the sports uh, complex by the Christian school. And I feel that um, it's not fair. So please speak to that tonight. Thank you, bye-bye. Does that conclude public comment on item 15? Yes, I believe so. Yes. Okay, uh, council, the issue is back in our hands at this point. Are there questions or comments? Well, I'm sure there are. <laughs> council member Fernandez, do you have any uh, questions or comments on this item? Um, I'm gonna just ask a brief question. I, I just wondered on the uh, contingency of the 5% for um, the construction and for the engineering, it's a 10% contingency. Is there a reason for that um, difference in? Sure. Uh, so for example, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, for the bridge construction itself, uh, we feel like the bridge construction is relatively straightforward. Uh, what we would call Greenfield, it's not, it's kind of out there in new property. Um, we felt like, you know, the bridge on its own is something that's, uh, there's, there's less uncertainties where if you're doing a traditional road project, you're working within uh, existing road. There are things that you can find while you're digging up the road. And that's what, why we usually go with a higher percentage contingency for a road project or utility project, sometimes 10, 15, or even 20%. Uh, here you're you're basically building a new ground, and so we felt like a five percent contingency was reasonable. Um, where construction management is almost more related to a uh, timeline schedule uh, that the contractor has, and so we don't have control necessarily over the schedule. We give the contractor a certain number of days, um, and they could come in ten percent less or use all of the days, and so um, that's more of a schedule driven by the contractor. And so there's less certainty, and that's why that's more of a 10% contingency. Okay. Thank you, Brent. And, um, and just I, I want to thank the the city residents who made their comments, and uh, thank you for your input, and uh, gives me some more information to consider. Thank you, uh, Council Member Garcia Cadena. Do you have any questions on this issue? Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I don't have questions, but I do have some strong concerns about approving a project like this, especially during this time. This is the most expensive time to be building anything. And I, I just have a lot of concerns when I, I saw that it was, you know, an increase of more than a million dollars of what we were originally um, talking about. I, I'm, I think this is a wonderful project. I just don't know if this is the time to be building it. Thank you, uh, Council Member Garcia Cadena. Council Member Landsberg, do you have any questions or comments? I do have a question for 
either Brent or a city manager, and it's this. I share the citizen name, first name Kevin, concern about safety issues on the pedestrian bridge. While we were discussing these issues and listening to everyone, I took the time to do a little internet research on pedestrian bridges and the immediate effect on the community is mostly positive. However, within days of opening many pedestrian bridges throughout the United States, they were tagged and defaced within days of being open. My concern is, do we have security systems that will be in place, specifically cameras? And I also noticed, Brent, that the fence was only six feet high. What is to prevent uh, scoff laws from going over that little fence and defacing the beautiful bridge that will be built? Brent? Brent? Sure, yeah. Um, I would say one thing, um, when we looked at the design of the pedestrian overcrossings uh, uh, in other locations, there's um, the design we chose for the ramp itself is a fairly open view shed. Um, so I don't know if, uh, I don't have a picture of it handy, but there's some with kind of constrained or narrow right of way that where they've built kind of a circular landing where you have a lot of hidden areas in a circular, um, almost like a, well, it's hard to say, but almost like an elevator, but it's um, very hidden with the fencing that would be around it, where this is uh, both sides of the structure. You can see the path. You don't have a fence blocking the vision of the path until you get onto the structure itself. Um, and so there's a pretty open view shed uh, next to, on the east side, uh, will, will be residential on both sides. Uh, so pretty active uh, in terms of being able to see it. Uh, Woodland Christian side, uh, pretty significant eyes on that, given uh, that they have uh, events, you know, obviously school during the day and many events in the evening. Um, so we do feel like there's, there's uh, it's different than a lot of other ped overcrossing locations in terms of eyes on it. Um, the six feet, it, you know, it is possible. I, I think it's pretty dangerous for somebody to, go over the side, it's, it's, uh, the standard is six feet. Um, uh, we, don't, uh, we didn't include security cameras or, or anything like that, uh, given you know, just the open view shed that it has, but certainly we can look into that if that's council's prerogative. Um, so I would say that that's my comments on that. Additional questions, council member Lanzenberg? No, I, I just, I'm not sure my concerns were uh, alleviated. Uh, you would think that we would build in some security measures for both graffiti defacement, as well as the security of the people using the bridge. Uh, it, it, you're right, it's wide open there and it's ripe for uh, issues. Uh, I, this is gonna be used by children. I would like, I would feel more secure knowing that we have measures in place to assist law enforcement in finding uh, individuals who wish to commit crimes on the bridge and or deface our beautiful bridge. Thank you, Council Member Landsberg. I'll go next. Uh, I was very, very troubled by the substantial price increase. I've had discussions with the manager about this, uh, but you know, looking at the bids, five of them, as uh, one of our callers pointed out, the low bid is significantly lower. So we have to know that basically this is the market we're in. Uh, this is, and whether it'll be less, would, would be less in the future is uncertain or unknown to any of us. It could well be more in the future. But I also think uh, I'm concerned about the safety of children. Uh, the fact is a substantial percentage of the students attending Pioneer High School come from the west side of 113. They have to be driven to school every day, or if they ride their bike, it has to be over that overpass, uh, which I have done. It is not a pleasant experience to ride a bike over that in overpass or to walk over that overpass. I'm talking about Gibson Road. So I consider uh, this thing a safety amenity uh, for, and as an alternative, for pedestrians, for bicyclists, for children. And, uh, and correspondingly, 
everybody on the east side of our community, particularly the Spring Lake area, has, has to get to the west side to go to either of our middle schools in Woodland. So maybe not everybody has the luxury of being driven to the school and has to get there on their own power. So this could be a vital link for them. So for recreation, uh, for access to public facilities, for safety, uh, I feel this is an important facility. And even though it galls me to have to spend this much to build the thing, uh, I believe it won't be less in the future. It's less. It's not likely to be less in the future. And delay is going to add to our costs in, in a number of ways, including the inability to use our current plan for storing material for the building of this, uh, this facility. I think staff should definitely look at, at safety concerns, as, as mentioned by Council Member Lansberg. But uh, even though it's, I'll be biting my tongue, I'll I'll, I'm going to support this tonight if we're prepared to go to a motion. Now, Council Member Vega, your district's on both sides of this bridge and underneath it. So it's your turn. Do you have questions or comments? Do, Mayor Seller, thank you so much. So I too, I'm disappointed to see the bid come so much higher. Um, mm -hmm. This, uh, I was, I have a few questions just on the timing of the bid, right? This project has been long time coming and I'm just, wanted to confirm that, you know, staff believes um, that if we delay that we're not going to hopefully get some reduction in construction costs. You know, if if we postpone this, are we gonna be in a situation where the costs are gonna continue to escalate and we're, we'll be having this same conversation if we wait? Can you, did I get that right from Brent's presentation? Waiting is not gonna help or not likely to reduce the costs? Yeah, given the consultation yeah. that we've had with our construction consultants um, and, you know, looking back at history and then looking forward at the um, unprecedented amount of money that's going to flood into the construction market through both state and federal infrastructure, um, prices are undoubtedly going to either hold or go up. Uh, in fact, if you were to put a percentage on one side of going up versus going down, uh, I would say 80% chance they're going to continue to increase and maybe a 20% chance they're going to go down. Um, you know, so, you know, you got to balance that, um, you know, into I think Mayor Stollard's point about the, the importance of this amenity as a, a safety feature, particularly for school uh, age kids. Um, you know, one incident uh, of a, you know, individual or child, right, uh, getting in a car accident on the way to school is worth it, right? Um, so if we can avoid one incident, uh, I think it's worth uh, taking that risk, which I think is low, uh, that the, the cost would actually go down. Um, you know, as Brent pointed out, the construction cost uh, areas that uh, saw the greatest uh, increase over our engineer's estimate were related to uh, commodity materials, those commodity markets uh, are very disrupted right now and they're going to continue to be very disrupted. So I think that feeds into our confidence that, you know, the volatility in the construction market will, will hold. Uh, we see, you know, residential construction builders planning for two, three years out and ahead. So they're bullish on demand. Um, so that's going to put more, more pressure on our supply chain system. So um, I think, you know, it's pretty clear that our, our staff recommendation is if we want to build this project, likely this is uh, the time to do it. Otherwise, we got to come up with a different funding strategy in the future, which won't rely on local sources. And then one other question just around the scaling back of the project. Is there anything um, within this project that we could scale back on to, to lower the Myra, price? Oh, could yeah. I interrupt? I would like a motion to extend the meeting for... I think we'd better say 45 minutes at this point. Is there a motion to do that? A motion to extend the meeting. Thank you. My motion is the mayor seconds. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. This would be extending the meeting to 945. Oh. Eight. I only have eight o'clock. Yeah, oh, you know something? Uh, the clock in here was never set back. Oh, I was going to say. <laughs> Mr. Manager. <laughs> I think the mayor's planning ahead here, so. I apologize, I withdraw my request. We'll, we'll set the motion aside and hopefully we won't need it. So I apologize for my oversight. It's a bad night for me on the technical stuff, Mr. Manager. Uh, please proceed with your question, Myra. Okay, all right, thank you. Let me get back to my notes here. Um, 
Okay, the scaling back of the project is that uh, is that feasible? I mean, I did, doesn't look like there's any frills or anything that is unnecessary, unnecessary aesthetics. But um, did staff consider scaling back to reduce the cost at all? Uh, well, yeah, we did, as Mr. Meyer indicated, uh, identify that you know a lot of the steel work in the project is is driving the cost up, and there there could be a way to simplify some of the steel railing on the bridge uh, to shave some cost off. Um, you know, it may be in the hundred thousand dollar range. It's not going to be a substantial change. Um, if you're asking you know, city manager's opinion on it. I think it's worth that extra $100,000 to have a bridge that's gonna be in place for 100 years that looks attractive as opposed to save $100,000 today. Um, so there may be, yeah, there may be some some areas uh, around the corners that we could trim a little bit, um, but uh, I think the project is, is fairly modest in design uh, as it stands, um, but uh, we will continue to work with the, the contractor if if the council desires to move forward to identify ways to contain cost. Thank you. Thank you for that. You. And also, that, and also uh, Brent, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was sorry. I was going to add one more thing. In terms of the cost, because we have certain kind of planning related costs, the fill material that's in Spring Lake Park, uh, you know, if we were to bid uh, next year or a year after, uh, there are certain costs that we take on. Uh, some of the right-of-way agreements would need to be extended. Uh, we would need to figure out, you know, either a different place to put the soil or to take it away and bring in new soil at a later time. Um, there would be issues related to how the park gets built out um, and, and the fact that we've, we've stored that about material at Spring Lake Park. So there's some, there are some costs if we came back a year from now, we'd need to not just be 5.2 million, we'd be, need to be something less than 5.2, just to be where we are, where we are at today. Um, because of those additional costs, uh, there could be, uh, depending on how long we wait, additional Caltrans reviews. Uh, six months, probably not going to be a big deal. Uh, a year or two, we might have to go through approvals with Caltrans to extend our uh, encroachment permit and other agreements with them. And then if I could just uh, acknowledge sort of staff's foresight, uh, we were given the opportunity to accept uh, free excess dirt from some of the developers out in Spring Lake that were um, uh, looking to off haul it. We said, hey, we're going to need substantial amount of soil to build the abutment on this bridge. Uh, we can store it here at Spring Lake Park. Uh, probably saved us Brent, um, hundreds of thousands of dollars in transportation cost and cost for uh, soil to build that. So um, you know, I just want to acknowledge uh, staff's uh, foresight in anticipating the need for this, this dirt and uh, partnering with uh, the builders in Spring Lake to have them deliver it there for us at no cost. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I, this, this bridge, like I said, has been a long time coming. I think it's a great, uh, it's fulfilling the plan, the general plan that the city set forward and certainly touches on safety of the kids that are walking or biking on a daily basis to and from school or to and from downtown. I think that's an important aspect for us to consider. Um, certainly the thought of having somebody, uh, a child or an adult, anybody get in an accident, um, because I do see a lot of pedestrian traffic over the Gibson overpass is just um, something that I, I, the thought of just uh, gives me chills. Um, this is also an opportunity for us to, to really uh, move forward on our sustainability plan, right? Having the ability for somebody to safely walk over um, between the, the east and the west side of town uh, is absolutely something that I'm supportive of. And just in looking at um, what I hope to continue to build upon is a healthy and active community. This project fits, fits right into that. So um, I would love to, to make a motion to, to approve. I'm happy to receive your motion, Mayor Bertam. Does, who would like to second that motion? I'll second that motion. I'm happy to hear it. A further discussion before we proceed to a vote. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Yes, Mayor Pro Tem Vega. Aye. Council Member Fernandez. Aye. Council Member Garcia Cadena. No. Council Member Landsberg? Aye. Mayor Stallard? Aye. Thank you. 
Thank you, colleagues. Tough, tough discussion, important discussion. Let's proceed. All right, uh, that takes us to item 16, now that I know it's just eight o'clock. <laughs> and this is informational presentation on proposed annexations. There's six of them. Mr. Manager, do you wanna hit the highlights on this one, please? Yeah, I'll touch on the highlights uh, and then ask our associate planner, Megan Meyer, to walk through the details. Um, so as part of our general plan implementation process, um, the, uh, the city's uh, current limit line does not uh, coexist with our uh, ultimate urban limit line. So there's a fair number of properties that land between uh, the voter approved urban limit line and the current uh, city limit line. And as the community grows, uh, we go through this process called annexation uh, of lands that are currently in the county, but are also contemplated within our general plan for future growth. Um, many of those properties actually already have development on them. So they're uh, development that occurred within the county uh, and often immediately adjacent to our city limit line uh, as it exists today. Um, so in working with staff um, in the, uh, the planning department uh, and identifying some properties that uh, we feel our, our candidates for moving forward with annexation that quite honestly should have been annexed um, 10, 15, 20 years ago. But, um, you know, I guess nobody had the, the time or uh, desire to, to move forward. Um, but certain circumstances are, are pointing to it, it's time to do that. Uh, there's also some properties that are proposed within this, um, this mix of properties that are owned by the city uh, that are in the, the county uh, currently. So, we have a fair number of, of properties that uh, while we own the property, it's actually in the county, uh, therefore subject uh, to uh, some county uh, jurisdiction in some cases, um, but uh, more importantly creates a situation where uh, the city actually pays taxes to the county for uh, those properties, uh, yet we more often than not provide all the services necessary to, uh, to serve those properties. Um, and then lastly, the last group is, is part of our industrial area, which um, is a, a north uh, east part of town, which has a, a fair amount of our future uh, potential jobs planned for it. So as part of the general plan update process, uh, we position those properties to uh, be annexed into the city and provide much needed uh, industrial and manufacturing and light manufacturing space. Um, so we have property owners that are um, willing to move forward with those developments. And before they could do so, we have to go through the annexation process. Um, you know, in total, uh, the reason why I've asked staff to, to work with um, these property owners and, and LAFCO to ultimately annex these uh, is the uh, financial benefit uh, to the city. Uh, once these properties uh, get annexed into the city uh, and we work through any remaining tax sharing, uh, tax exchange agreements with the county, uh, we will be in a position to actually uh, get property tax, sales tax, uh, transit occupancy tax um, uh, to the city, whereas uh, currently, if it stays in the county, all of those taxes uh, flow through to the other taxing jurisdictions, uh, as well as uh, the county. Um, often those properties, uh, since they're so proximate to our city, uh, have our fire department, our police department, our code enforcement often will respond to issues on those properties. So. Uh, we are not getting any of the revenue benefit, yet we have uh, a large portion of the, the service uh, impacts associated with those. The development on those properties often uh, access our roads. Uh, so there's a need for us to you know, come to the table with the county, uh, negotiate a tax sharing agreement on those properties uh, and get uh, our rightful amount of uh, the revenue necessary to pay for the services. Uh, we also have several of these properties that are in the county, believe it or not, that are actually serviced by city sewer and water. Um, those properties went through a, a process where we actually entered into an agreement with them to provide those services. And then in exchange, uh, they paid for connection to our system, um, but uh, also agreed to uh, annex into the city upon request. Um, so most notably, uh, one of the properties which Ms. Meyer will touch on is uh, what we refer to as the Barnard Court uh, development, which is up uh, at the north end of West Street, uh, just before you hit I-5 where the Denny's and there's a new AMPM uh, gas station up there. Uh, those properties uh, received uh, sewer and water services a while back, um, agreed to annexation upon request. Uh, we are now starting to see uh, additional development interest um, approaching the county. Uh, that was identified as a key important gateway into our community as you're coming south on I-5. It's really the first part of Woodland that you see. 
Uh, and we really want to do uh, what we can to retain sort of land use control over uh, how those developments um, you know, create uh, an entryway for our community uh, on top of uh, some of the, the taxing benefits that I mentioned before. Um, so I'll pause there, uh, have uh, Ms. Meyer walk you through uh, the specifics of each one, uh, and I may provide uh, some closing remarks before giving it over to the council for questions. Mr. Manager and colleagues, do we need much explanation here? I think you've covered it pretty well. And I'm just, we have other topics that are gonna take a little time tonight. Mayor Saller, I do have um, just one question, and it was in the uh, in the public comment, and I had that as a note too. Um, Ken, does the sports park parcel does that annexation change? Um, it's the way that it's structured within Spring Lake, or uh, is is it not the the portion that is allocated as a Spring Lake park that we're looking at? Right. So correct. So the. The portion that's being proposed to be annexed is kind of the future phase of the build out of the sports park. So it's not part of the current improved sports park facility. Um, and even if it was annexing it into the city uh, would not affect um, the CFD allocation that goes towards the maintenance of that sports park. So um, to Ms. Owen's question, uh, annexing this property in uh, unfortunately would not affect uh, the CFD uh, obligation uh, for the Spring Lake residents towards the sports park. Um, however, if and when we expand the sports park out uh, in this area, whether it's in the county or in the city, uh, there is a stipulation in that CFD uh, that Spring Lake would pay a proportionate share towards uh, those amenities. Uh, however, at this time, there is no uh, plans uh, expansion with uh, City dollars at the sports park. Uh, there is, as you know, uh, the girls' fast pitch uh, is moving forward with improvements to uh, build additional softball fields for girls' fast pitch out there, uh, which will be maintained by uh, girls' fast pitch uh, in the Woodland uh, Rec Foundation, uh, and would not be a maintenance obligation under the CFD for Spring Lake. Thank you. Those are all my questions. Okay, Megan, I'm sorry to kind of short circuit your presentation, but uh, I appreciate you putting the slide up so we can see them. <laughs> no problem. I would like to add just one more thing. I would like to say that staff has had preliminary discussion with both LAFCO and Yolo County, as well as outreach to the property owners, um, both a courtesy notice to the property owners that are under MOUs currently with the city and to a small area that is not under our current MOU. Um, we actually did phone calls as well. So um, just kind of opening those communication lines with, um, you know, the annexation areas. Um, and so I just wanted to mention that. And additionally, um, the Northeast area may be on a slightly faster trajectory track for annexation. So it may come in through council um, a little bit faster than the other areas. Um, and it also has, because mostly because it has a tax sharing agreement already in place. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. And I, I'd like to mention that LAFCO stands for Local Agency Formation Commission. It's a, it's a, collective agency collaborative of the cities and the counties of Yolo County. And uh, only two city representatives are on LAFCO at any given time. I'm currently ending my four year service this coming May. So uh, Woodland will not have a representative on LAFCO for two to four years after that. So this is a good time to, to deal with this while Woodland still has somebody on the local agency formation commission. That's my opinion. All right, um, is, is this just for information only, Mr. Manager? Correct, we thought um, given its uh, significance and the fact that ultimately uh, these will be coming to the council for uh, final approval of uh, pre-zoning, uh, environmental action, as well as in some cases a tax sharing agreement, uh, it'd be good to give you a heads up on, uh, on these items and uh, sort of prime you a little bit before they show up on a council agenda and you ask where this came from, so. Thank you. Yes, who's oh, sorry. That's Council, council Member Fernandez. Thank you, Mayor Stafford. Yes. Sorry. I just wanted to, um, Ken answered a lot of my questions earlier today, but or yesterday, but I um, maybe want to just double check um, 
with Megan. A lot of these are industrial or commercial areas. Um, is the foreseeable future, will that, could that zoning change once it is annexed by the city? Or is that something that isn't? So we do go through a pre-zoning process and it's anticipated that they will be pre-zoned and zoned um, in coordination with the existing general plan land use designation. So not in the foreseeable future. Um, most of the areas, as you said, are industrial or open space. We do have some regional commercial on number five. Okay, thank you. Additional questions of Megan or the city manager? All right, that'll conclude our, our discussion of the item. Thank you for bringing it to us. It's actually pretty exciting to kind of clean up some of these little things as well as take on some big opportunities in the future as we seek to uh, expand our industrial capacity and particularly in the industrial area as well as our research and tech park. All right, um, that brings us to item 17. Excuse me, is that right? 17, yes, and that's the second community pool project scope and financing. And uh, Mr. Manager, we're gonna introduce the subject, please. Yeah, happy to. Um, so as the council requested uh, a few meetings back, uh, presenting an item to the council for uh, an update on the second community pool, which has been a high priority uh, council goal uh, for quite some time as well. Uh, wanted to outline uh, the project scope where we less last left off uh, with the council after a community process and then begin to outline a potential funding uh, uh, concept for the project should the council desire to move forward uh, in the near term with constructing this project. Uh, so a quick uh, refresh on, on this project, which is actually... Um, you know, dates back to when the city uh, had to close Hiddleston Pool back in 2008 uh, due to the uh, budgetary situation we were in. Uh, we went through a process to evaluate uh, potentially rehabbing the pool uh, as it did not comply with many of the, uh, the health uh, requirements and state codes. Uh, ultimately, it was just determined that the pool, uh, Hiddleston Pool, needed to be closed uh, permanently and uh, ultimately demolished, uh, which uh, eventually led to a process which began in 2016 for the council um, to uh, work with the community to uh, develop a feasibility study uh, for a second pool complex in Woodland. Uh, we held a series of workshops during 2016 and 2017 uh, and then presented a draft report to the Parks and Rec Commission uh, in February of 2017 and then brought uh, all that uh, information back to the council uh, after uh, engaging with the council subcommittee uh, to provide preliminary recommendation on uh, project scope design, as well as uh, ask some questions and ultimately get direction around uh, where we would locate uh, the second aquatic complex. So uh, ultimately uh, June in 2018, the council approved a million dollar set aside uh, from the Measure J uh, fund. Uh, subsequently, in that year, in September, Council authorized moving forward with a joint use agreement with uh, Woodland Joint Unified uh, to uh, secure the site, uh, the preferred site, uh, after that uh, community process, uh, which was a two and a half acre site on the district owned property just south of Pioneer High School, which is identified for a future middle school. Uh, so the Council uh, authorized us to move forward to negotiate that joint use agreement, uh, which was part of the uh, city's negotiation with the district to acquire the Willow Springs uh, school property um, as it was decommissioned and vacant at the time. And we expressed interest uh, to secure that site for a new fire station. Uh, and ultimately these two agreements uh, were approved by the council in June of 2019. And, uh, over uh, the next year, uh, the city continued to prioritize uh, the project and give direction to staff to um, uh, identify funding and uh, move forward with, um, with uh, strategies to deliver the, the pool project. Uh -oh. Screen froze, there we go. S Sorry, go ahead, Mr. Mayor. I'm just gonna ask if Megan would, would please mute herself because we're hearing a lot of noise. Thank you, Megan, could you mute yourself? Thank you. All right. So this, Thank you. 
Yeah, sorry, this slide here shows uh, the proposed site for uh, the pool complex. Again, it's uh, on Pioneer Avenue, just south of Pioneer High School on a district owned property. Uh, we have a, a joint use agreement with the district for that site, um, which has some stipulations uh, in it. We, we have about a 10 year period to uh, deliver a funding plan and commence construction on the pool. Uh, we paid $250,000 uh, to the district for this privilege to reserve this area, um, ultimately for uh, delivering the project, which would be a joint use project. Um, the agreement um, outlines uh, some shared use parameters that would provide district uh, access to the pool for their aquatic teams. Um, during uh, competitive season and for swim meets, uh, and then reserve time, of course, for the public um, during off hours. Uh, the One of the primary reasons this site was chosen, uh, not only due to the, the shared use benefit in providing uh, the Pioneer students uh, access to a, a swimming pool, uh, but the district agreed to allow access of their parking lot for uh, the pool complex. And given the um, sort of the off peak periods for the pool complex during the summer to the, the school season, uh, it was an ideal arrangement uh, and one where uh, ultimately the city would save uh, several million dollars in having to construct uh, its own separate parking lot uh, and maintain that parking lot for the pool. So uh, a good indication of um, collaboration between the city and the district to, to reach agreement on this. Uh, it is a 50 year agreement. Uh, so we have, uh, once we construct the project, a 50 year period to, to operate the pool. Uh, there are uh, additional uh, option um, provisions for the city to extend that, uh, that shared use agreement for up to 20 additional years. Um, this agreement became effective when we closed escrow on the Willow Springs school site, uh, which was in 2019. Uh, so the clock is to some degree ticking uh, on this agreement. However, uh, if we need additional time, I trust that the district would be cooperative in working with us, um, but that would be subject to, to their agreement. So this slide here shows um, the, the final sort of preferred concept for this two and a half acres, how it would be developed. Uh, I just want to touch real quickly on uh, at the time when the council received this report, uh, the, the pool complex um, and aquatic center that was contemplated uh, had these amenities in it. Um, first of all, it had, of course, a building program to support the pool complex uh, that would have office, lockers, dressing rooms, uh, lifeguard rooms, mechanical areas, uh, chemical storage, uh, and whatnot, um, but also, um, you know, likely concession area. Uh, the two pools would be um, sort of divided uh, into a little bit more program slash uh, competitive uh, and then recreation. So uh, the pool that you see on the right there, the rectangle naturally is uh, the more programmed uh, competitive pool, which would have uh, 10 lanes for lap swim and then eight lanes for competitive swim tournaments, uh, allowing some uh, warm up uh, lanes uh, for those uh, meets that they have out there. Uh, shallow uh, learn to swim area so that um, during the summer season or uh, aquatics uh, uh, programming uh, offered by the city, we can provide uh, some uh, swim lessons for uh, swimmers that we're learning um, in a shallow area safer. Uh, also would provide recreational uh, swim, uh, so it could be flexible. It's not always going to be a competitively uh, set up pool for, for lap, um, but during high peak uh, summer times, uh, uh, could be flexed into a recreational pool as well. And of course, would have uh, ADA accessibility uh, in varying depths, uh, depending on uh, the type of use. The second pool that was identified is more of an activity pool or a rec pool. Um, that would have uh, a zero depth uh, beach type entry uh, to make it more approachable for uh, younger um, swimmers. I'd also have interactive uh, water play features in it. Uh, don't get too hung up on what you see in this picture. These are just concepts. Um, there would be uh, potentially features such as a, a current channel uh, or slides that were looked at. Uh, however, those get more expensive. Uh, these would also uh, provide an opportunity for fitness classes uh, to be offered uh, where folks uh, can uh, exercise in a, a shallower uh, pool environment uh, and then also provide recreational swim, of course, uh, during the summer peak hours. And then all of that uh, sort of embraced and complemented by uh, a nice uh, cool turf area so that you could have parties um, and activities there or a refuge during the hot summer months while your kids uh, are off swimming. 
So that was uh, sort of the vision and the concept uh, for the project um, when we left off back in 2019, early 2020. Um, the project cost estimate uh, at that time was just over 7 million. Uh, we've updated that um, based on our current uh, construction climate. And I've identified roughly about a $9 million uh, total project cost. So that includes uh, design, uh, inspection, construction, um, uh, as well as soft costs. Uh, in order for us to uh, deliver a pool at nine, $9 million, uh, we took the liberty to begin to illustrate uh, how we might fund uh, that project. Uh, there we go. Um, so what you see outlined here uh, is, again, just a preliminary funding approach that uh, we welcome uh, the council and ultimately we'll need community feedback on, is this the appropriate approach if we wanna prioritize delivering this pool in the short term? Um, so I'm gonna walk through these uh, in order here. First, Measure J, as, as the council is well aware, uh, has prioritized now in several uh, allocations, uh, supplemental uh, Measure J fund balance. And currently we have uh, 1.75, uh, million uh, available uh, unspent. We did use the $250,000 of additional funding uh, towards uh, securing the site. Uh, we also have uh, development agreement payments. Um, so uh, similar to what we referred to during the uh, Sports Park Drive overcrossing, uh, there are supplemental uh, revenues that we uh, will collect through those development agreement payments that are not uh, part of the, the Mellow Roos or the CFD in Spring Lake. So these are uh, discretionary funds uh, that will be collected when these permits are issued uh, by these home builders that we will collect. Um, we anticipate, um, in addition to what was allocated for the pedestrian overcrossing, uh, $3.9 million, um, of which about $3 million we anticipate should construction activity uh, keep pace uh, would be available uh, as early as 2023. Uh, so those funds are, are coming in uh, pretty quickly at the moment. Um, and then the next line item uh, is a Spring Lake Parks uh, Sports Park Phase 3. Uh, so as we have heard uh, from some of the community members and has been talked about, uh, Spring Lake had an obligation to uh, complete um, or build additional parkland outside of um, the Spring Lake uh, proper area, and it was identified uh, that that additional land to meet uh, the development's obligation would uh, be constructed as part of a community-wide sports park complex. Uh, so there's a, a percentage of that sports park uh, that is uh, going to satisfy the park requirement for Spring Lake. Uh, so in the um, financing plan for Spring Lake, there are funds uh, that we collect at building permit uh, that don't get mingled in with the CFD um, that the Melarus payments um, go to pay off, but it's a separate park impact fee fund that goes uh, into the city and we collect that funding. And then ultimately uh, we deliver uh, construction of the parks in Spring Lake. We have started the process um, to go back to the community in Spring Lake to ask uh, what types of amenities they'd like to see in the remaining uh, neighborhood parks in Spring Lake. Uh, and then uh, it has been planned that the, the final uh, revenues received for Spring Lake uh, Park impact fees would then get allocated to the sports park phase three is, is the final amenity. So let's build out the neighborhood parks in Spring Lake first. And then uh, the last dollars in the door for Spring Lake parks would then get prioritized towards the sports park. Um, there is a, uh, an option for us to um, allocate the funding for sports parks phase three that's coming from development in Spring Lake and have that go to a pool complex. Um, in fact, there was a pool complex identified in uh, the Spring Lake Park uh, financing plan uh, at other specific locations. Uh, so there's a, uh, an option for us to uh, update that, uh, that Nexus study, have conversations with the neighborhood to say, uh, would you prefer that we allocate uh, the remaining uh, Spring Lake Park phase three dollars um, towards a swimming pool complex as opposed to uh, the phase three of the sports park? Uh, so that would yield 3.75 uh, uh, roughly million dollars, of which um, by 2023, we'll probably have about a half a million dollars um, received after we've built out uh, the remaining parks in Spring Lake. Um, 
So uh, clearly uh, a line item that would require um, community input uh, and discussion with uh, Spring Lake residents before um, prioritizing that funding. Uh, I would offer that if uh, ultimately that is decided, uh, the other benefit it would have is that we would uh, essentially not add uh, another um, $3.735 million worth of improvements uh, at the sports park to the CFD obligation for Spring Lake. So the residents in Spring Lake would be relieved of that, uh, that future CFD increase. Uh, and it would simply uh, have their park fees uh, allocated to the capital cost for um, the, uh, the swimming pool. And then the last item uh, is uh, about a million dollars that um, I anticipate is uh, within the capacity of our community to uh, support the project. We've been uh, certainly approached by uh, many residents that have indicated they'd love to see another aquatics facility built uh, in Woodland. Uh, and they are uh, so excited that they're willing to um, consider contributing uh, substantial financial uh, dollars to, to see that come to reality. And so I have preliminarily identified about a million dollars uh, that I think is within reach uh, of this community to, to get behind uh, towards funding a pool. Um, and so what you see here is, um, you know, a, a potential funding framework that uh, would deliver uh, roughly ten and a half million dollars. Uh, should we allocate all of that uh, funding to the projects? Certainly, in excess of what we hope to be uh, the high end of the project uh, cost. The right-hand column says, "Look, if we want to deliver this pool in the next several years, um, how much uh, of these funding sources could we re reasonably rely on?" Um, and so, that six million is certainly short of the nine. Um, so that gives us, um, you know, some potential options to look at uh, in terms of, you know, do you scale back to the project? Do you defer the project a couple of years till we get to nine million, or do we potentially uh, borrow against uh, some of these other uh, future revenue costs to allow us to move forward, get that project uh, delivered uh, in finance for maybe several years before the remaining revenues uh, materialize? And so that is. Um, you know, uh, what I believe our best chance at uh, identifying funding sources uh, that would not compromise uh, other competing high priority uh, capital projects uh, in the city at this time, and uh, one that we welcome uh, council and ultimately community feedback on before uh, moving forward. So, let's see. Whoop. Um, so next steps, uh, the purpose of tonight's, uh, you know, introduction of this item, reintroduction to the council is uh, to get your feedback on two areas. One is, you know, is the project scope um, as, you know, tentatively outlined here, more or less in alignment with what the council uh, believes the community uh, expects and we can reasonably deliver and is the right amenity for, for Woodland. And then two, um, with the, the funding sort of framework concept that I've outlined here, um, are these, um, uh, you know, comfortable enough for the council to say move forward staff and begin to evaluate those at a higher level of detail, have conversations with the Spring Lake residents and the rest of the community about um, using these funds to prioritize towards this project. Uh, I would suggest and the staff report uh, goes so far as to um, encourage the council to appoint a subcommittee to work with uh, staff uh, on these issues and then ultimately bring back uh, in October um, an update on uh, the project design scope, as well as a kind of final preliminary funding strategy uh, and timeline for delivering the project. So uh, with that, I will conclude and turn it back to the council for questions and comments. Thank you, Mr. Manager. That was a comprehensive presentation. I'm sure we all appreciated it. Uh, let me ask council, we do have public comment on this. Would you choose to hear it first or shall we proceed with our questions and discussion? Let's hear the public comment, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Landsberg. Uh, Madam Clerk, I believe you have a couple comments to read. I do, yes. I have one very short comment from Polly Van Myden, Inca DeWitt, and Susie McGibbon, and it's hallelujah, good luck in resolving this problem. <laughs> they are the stalwarts who have worked on this <laughs> for years. Bless them. <laughs> and my next email is, um, from Tuan Gwen and Fabiola Zuno. We have been residents of Woodland for more than nine years and have come to appreciate the city and its small town charms. We've made Woodland our home and are raising our young son here in the Spring Lake community. 
We were very excited to hear in 2018 that the city has secured land for a new swimming center by Pioneer High School. But now, three years later, we have not heard of any new developments on the, on the front. The purpose of this letter is to express our support for a new swimming center. There are several reasons why a new swimming center in the Spring Lake community is important. The Spring Lake community has grown tremendously in the last several years. We've had many young families as well as retirees come into the area. These families as well as mine had to either drive to the city of Davis or Charles Brook community pool to swim and to enroll our children for swim lessons. Not all families have the means or transportation to get to the current swimming centers. A swimming center located in an economically and socially diverse community like Spring Lake will bring the community together. It will provide a, a venue where everyone can benefit from physical exercise and social interactions. We hope the city of Woodland continues to find a path forward to getting a swim center built in the Spring Lake community. Thank then I you. have the re remainder of Brian Coward's uh, email. My concern about the pool is in the rumors that are circulating that the financing will use Spring Lake infrastructure fees to fund its construction. Spring Lake has been drastically altered from amendments to its specific plan. It's unrecognizable, really. Two school sites are gone. Two commercial sites are gone. We've had medium density residential, which would have made housing more accessible to Woodlanders, spread out for lower density residential. Green belts removed, all because developers decried it feasibility, infeasibility and the city listened. And the fire station will presumably be removed as well. Essentially, the city has condoned infill in a newly developing community and it's resulting in urban sprawl. This all said, and we still don't have a single park in Spring Lake finished. Road 25A between State Route 113 and Road 102 is incomplete. There are serious drainage concerns at 20, Road 25A and Road 102, which could result in flooding in the Spring Lake community. And since we forfeited two school sites in Spring Lake, the only option that is now available in the tech park is not an idle one because of its proximity to businesses. I don't believe, believe Spring Lake can afford to contribute towards a community pool until we hear, have a clear financial plan to address the critical infrastructure needs of our community. Sincerely, Brian Coward. And I do want to check, um, Okay, I do have a longer email that I also sent to each of you, so I will um, read a portion of it. I don't know that I'll finish in three minutes. Good evening. This is my first comment into the City Council via email, so bear with me. As a Spring Lake resident, I recently started to question how the Spring Lake specific plan had allocated for three elementary schools, and we do not have even one yet. As I am acquiring information from pre previously enacted committees, I am becoming more alarmed at the mismanagement of funds from our Mello Roos CFD for this community, along with the changes that the city council has made over the years, removing such infrastructure as two elementary schools. I see that the new pool being proposed is not only in Spring Lake, but the city is purchasing previously allocated 2.5 acres of property from Woodland Joint Unified Schools District that was supposed to be for our middle schools. The school district has now sold off two other parcels of land that were supposed to be sites of future elementary schools. And now we have a full build out of residence, residences and no elementary school. One open enrollment school that cannot even house half of the students needed. This situation is dire. I have spoken to many teachers at Douglas School that were seriously concerned with where they are going to be expected to put the upcoming 1,000 children coming out of the Spring Lake Elementary School District. I have been alerted to the trail of budgeting and mismanagement by the school district in regards to these projects, and I'm now here to beg the City Council to not take any other property from the school district in order to make some sort of city project. This pool is not necessary, a school is. We need to plan for the fact that we need every single square inch of what the school district has allotted for schools. Not one inch goes towards anything that is not a school. I would also like to ask how this pool is being funded. I see that some of the money has been fulfilled. I know, I wanted to know if one cent of funding for this pool is coming from Melarus and not the city fund, which is now just a slush fund of Spring Lake taxpayers anyways. Let's all be honest. The Spring Lake residents have already paid for the city sports park that our children cannot even use because it, because it is in the other side of the freeway. We are not funding another stupid city pet project before we get all of the necessary infrastructure over here. 
I am building joining committees with Jennifer Owens, Brian Coward, and others, and we are going to be very vocal and very public with all gathered information. You can expect not only Nextdoor, but Facebook, Instagram, and a blog website devoted to all, to any and all information that we can gather that is public knowledge regarding Spring Lake community, especially all of the short-sighted mismanagement of prior elementary sites and our tax dollars. We are organizing to get any and all information regarding who has been responsible responsible for getting the Spring Lake specific plan and getting us into the unnecessary situation we find ourselves in now. No schools, no infrastructure, yet millions of dollars in taxes being poured into city coffers. I don't want the run around of bureaucracy. I want accountability, something that has been distinctly lacking in this whole endeavor. Hey, Anna, this is Jay. I got a three minute okay. timer is up. Okay, thank you. All right, well, thank you, Madam Clerk, for sharing the feedback from our citizens. I appreciate the fact that people take the time to share their views. I'll return the issue now to the council for discussion. And uh, I'd just like to say at the outset that uh, council member Landsberg and I have been working on this issue. Uh, I would like to see the council allow us to continue as the council subcommittee. So that's one of the issues we have to take up as well. And now questions or comments on the city managers for presentation. Mayor Stallard, I have a uh, Kevin raising his hand. Oh, excuse me. We have one more pu item public comment. Kevin, please proceed. And Kevin, what's your last name? Kevin. Hi, uh, it's Shimokawa. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. I, I don't think we've met, so please proceed. Um, I, I'd sent this by email, so it would be read, but I'll, I'll just kind of read my email. Um, I think it's wonderful that the city, the, the council is planning amenities that increase the profile of Woodland. Um, but as a resident of Spring Lake, um, I just have to ask, why are the amenities all placed at the furthest extent of Spring Lake? Um, and how am I supposed to get behind what seem like inessential uh, functions of the city when my daughter can't get into the school that bears the community's name? Um, I really do appreciate what you do and the effort and the thought that you put into all the items before the council. Um, but I, I sincerely believe that if there's going to be a technology center and a technology oriented workforce in Woodland, there has to be an emphasis on education. Uh, and now I know that's the domain of the, uh, the school district, um, but I, I just have to bring it up where I can and try to make some noise and some rumblings about it. Um, Education is very important to families. And if we, if we want the, that workforce and that profile, then something has to be done. So thank you. Thanks, Kevin, for weighing in. Happy to talk to you further at any time, uh, perhaps offline from a meeting. So feel free to contact me. I'm sure any of us would be happy to visit with you more about these issues. All right, and that would go for any of our commenters tonight. So I believe is that the end of public comment, Ms. Madam Clerk? Yes. All right, well, we'll come back to council again. Um, I'm ready, ready to weigh in if, if people would like me to go first. Mayor Schaller, I'd be happy to, to chime in. Go forward, please. So uh, Ken and staff, thank you so much for putting this together. I appreciate all the thought that went into this. Uh, again, this is another uh, project that has been long time coming and expected from the community. I do just want to, um, you guys have heard Spring Lake residents uh, throughout tonight's meeting and, and even um, prior to this meeting, just consternation around the funds um, that were earmarked uh, for certain amenities and just not enough clarity or communication around where those funds were, were invested. So um, can you mention this? And I'm definitely gonna um, request that we do ample and open communication to explain um, the funding. So I, I have heard uh, from many residents, this sports park, um, portion that Spring Lake pays for as unfair and unjust as this is a city amenity. I think there may be support uh, of community members to, to shift that over to the pool, but I would love to hear the community support that and say that. And just all in all, clarify uh, the source of funds and, and also the discretion, um, as you heard some of these comments tonight were around the school and just um, talking to this, uh, this perception that um, we're, we're taking from 
um, a promised amenity and shift it to another one. So just open and ample communication is what I ask in this process. I'm looking forward to um, having more community input and to really guiding, guiding this project forward. One, one last thing I have, um, I've had the, the pleasure of, of spending a lot of time uh, at our community pool that we have. And uh, if you all have not, uh, take, a, take some time to go out there and look at the facilities, the locker rooms, are, are old and dilapidated. Um, during swim lessons, we have families coming in there of all um, of community members, all walks of life, our swim team. Um, the community really deserves a, a aquatic center that they can be proud of. We can expand more programming. You know, Christine can speak to the demand for swim lessons. Um, I heard from a lot of uh, community members that unfortunately couldn't get in on the swim lessons and missed out. Um, I also had the opportunity to visit the uh, Rancho Cordova um, swim center, and I saw the smile on our uh, of our uh, rec team um, swimmers that were so delighted to be in such a beautiful complex. I really think that investing in our youth uh, and more um, opportunities for them to learn water safety is really a, a something that we, we have to support for the well-being of our community. Um, so that'll be all. Thank you so much, Mayor Seller. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. All right, uh, uh, Council Member Fernandez. Thank you, Mayor Stallard. Um, I would just like to um, echo what um, Council Member Garcia Cadena said earlier about the timing for um, this type of uh, expense. I know that it's something that the city would love to have. I know I would love to have a pool on the Southeast area of town, which would be um, just a few blocks away. But I also would like to look at our fiscal responsibility. Um, it is a, an endeavor that, um, we just saw that it, it's going to cost over nine million dollars. Uh, in order to maintain that on a yearly basis, it's seven hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars a year. So, coming out of a pandemic that we still are unsure of what's going to happen, I would like to echo the sentiment that this project, unfortunately, should wait. Uh, maybe it's just not the right time for us to move forward uh, on this uh, project. Um, I would love to say that I. Um, can support the expense that um, the city, I, I don't believe that we would be uh, fiscally responsible by in incurring this type of expense at this time. We don't know how we're going to um, yet spend uh, the ARP funding and how we're gonna, how the city itself is going to overcome uh, this pandemic that we're not out of yet. So I, I think that um, we're being a little, um, Eager, and then I re and I realize some feel like we've waited a, a long time for it, and I and I realize that there are those who would love to see it occur now or yesterday, um, but unfortunately, I feel that it is not um, something that is being fiscally responsible. There are a lot of amenities that uh, the residents in Spring Lake feel that they've uh, been short sighted, that we've been short sighted on, and so in advocacy for um, our residents. Um, it, it's difficult to say, but I'm not sure that this is the right time um, to take um, the time to, to plan for a pool. Thank you, Council Member Fernandez. Additional comments? Oh, uh, Mr. Landsberg has his hand up and we'll take oh, him I'll, next and then we'll go to Tanya, okay? I'll, uh, I'll pass to... Uh, Oh, okay. Thank you. Tanya, please proceed. Thank you. Um, so I, I, you know, I've been in Woodland a very long time here. And when we lost our other pool, um, people were under the impression that it, we would uh, have a new pool in a short period of time. And it's, it's been quite a while. And so I think this is one of those um, projects that we need to continue moving forward with. This is something that, um, as um, Mayor Pro Tem Vega said, uh, this is something that brings the community together. This is something that would be used by, um, you know, a, a good majority of all ages of our community. And I just see see this as as a necessity for our our um, our city. So I, I would be in favor of moving this forward. Thank you, Council Member Garcia Cadena. Council Member Landsberg. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I acknowledge all the comments that have been made tonight, both for and against this project at this time. You know, Mr. Mayor, some of us didn't grow up with a backyard pool. And the only way we could cool off in hot summer is to go to a public, we called it a plunge in those days. We need another pool on the east side of town because the one that we have does not meet, meet, meet the needs of this community who are now 63,000 strong. Some may question that the timing of this pool is wrong. I disagree with that because I've never heard of a project going forward two or three years later that's going to be less than today. Today is the day we have a financing plan in place that's going to require public participation and, and uh, like-minded citizens who will help fund this project along because they care for this project and the need for it. I can't think of another public project that benefits such a diverse group of individuals from toddlers who are learning to swim and be safe in water, from uh, young children who are learning to swim for the first time, adolescents who may start a swimming program and may end up on a swim team, teenagers who both re recreate and compete in aquatics, adults such as ourselves, senior citizens who benefit from the aquatic center. And more importantly, Mr. Mayor, as the son of a disabled individual, place for disabled person to cool down as well. We can't forget about those individuals. I go on for hours as to why and what the benefit is of a public pool. I'm not gonna bore everybody with that, but it adds to this community. It adds to the safety of our children. It increases public safety. It increases fitness for those who need fitness classes. And more importantly, it does combat child obesity. I can go on and on, Mr. Mayor, but I'm not gonna do that. This is the time for this project. You and I have visited other projects and other communities smaller than ours, Mr. Mayor, and they found a way to get their pool project because they learned the importance of another pool project. I think it's time to move this project along and I fully endorse it and I'm ready to get my shovel out and start digging. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Landsberg. I guess that just leaves me, and I think I'm pretty well on the record about this. Uh, I've been on this council since 2011. Uh, the pool, the, Hills, the Hiddleston pool had been shut down in 2008. It's 13 years later. Uh, Woodland had, had two pools at the time it was basically about 20 to 25,000 people. Today we have 63,000 people. We have as many as 500 children in the afternoon crowding into Brooks Pool. And people on the east side of the community, their kids can't ride the bikes all the way over to Brooks. It's especially over Gibson Overpass. It's just not a good situation. Uh, and there, there's a feeling, although we are not the school board, but there's a feeling of inequality between the two high schools. And this is another way to address that. The original plan was to put the pool at the, at the sports park, but that again would, would be on the other side of the freeway. So here's an opportunity to put a major community amenity proximate to, a, to the second high school, just as the existing pool is to the first high school. And, and, and in the neighborhood, which by far has the most children in the entire community, because it's the young family neighborhoods predominantly, the newer neighborhoods. Uh, I, I haven't got the patience to wait anymore. I mean, I feel like we've disappointed citizens for years over our failure to move on this. And I've made it my number one priority. I felt at our council retreat, we collectively made it our number one capital priority. And it's just time to get it done. So the manager has come back to us with, with at least some numbers on paper and, and the ability to move it forward. And, and I'm not gonna rest until this pool gets done. That's, that's all there is to it. Now, council, we're being asked to appoint a subcommittee. I've asked that you consider council member Landsberg and myself for that. Is there any objection to that? I'm not seeing any and I respectfully accept dissent, but you have to understand, you know, when you've been sitting here for 11 years and something you wanted to do in the year one is still not done. Uh, it's beyond the point of my being willing to be patient any longer. 
I, I feel it's important for the welfare of our community. I want to mention one more thing. Davis has five community pools with 72,000 people. We have one for 63,000. Plus they're on next door to a university with three more pools. So the fact of the matter is we are not serving our community in this important area for safety, for learning how to swim, for recreation, for all the things that Rich enumerated. So, you know, I'm sorry, but other issues are not going to be very large in my consciousness as I attempt to find a solution and a path for getting this done for our, our community. All right. Is there any other comments or discussion or any more motion anybody wishes to show? <laughs> I'm not seeing anything and there's dead silence across the screen. So I think that'll probably conclude our discussion of item 17 for tonight, but it'll be back regularly. And item 18 is our last item for the evening and that's the American Rescue Plan update and funding plan. This is ARP as it's known. And Mr. Manager has a, has a proposal for how we proceed to deal with the $11.1 .1 million that the federal government has allocated to our community with lots of strings, Mr. Manager. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I will point out we have three to the hour. So if the council's pleasure is to extend for say 15 minutes, I think we can get through this item. All right, I'll re renew council Premier Pro Tem Vega's motion that I seconded, but we'll extend it for 15 minutes to 9.15. Madam Clerk, call the roll, please. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Vega. Aye. Council Member Fernandez. Aye. Council Member Garcia Cadena. Aye. Council Member Landsberg. Aye. Mayor Steller. Aye. Thank you. All right, I'll proceed. Um, and actually, I, I've asked Kim McKinney, uh, Ministry of Services Director, to uh, participate in this presentation as well as, as she's tracking much more closely the uh, federal parameters around the use of the funds. Um, but wanted to bring to the council a quick update on uh, where things stand relative to the city of Woodlands um, evaluation, ultimately uh, development of a framework for allocation of the American Rescue Plan uh, dollars for which the mayor indicated uh, we were successful in confirming 11.1 uh, .1 million uh, that we will be eligible for. Uh, we have received the initial allocation of 5.5 .5 million uh, from the federal government um, and are now awaiting sort of final uh, clarity from the, the federal government regarding uh, how those funds uh, will be allowed and permitted to be uh, invested in our community. Uh, as we've said before, um, and the council has, has echoed, right, uh, we don't want to miss the opportunity to take this one-time funding um, and invest it in a way that has lasting impact in our community, and at the same time, um, really hits uh, towards where uh, the community has been impacted um, uh, most severely uh, through this pandemic. Um, so quick refresher reminder, right? The, the federal guidance indicates that uh, there's several key categories that you can allocate um, and use this funding for. First is responding to the public health emergency around the pandemic, which is fairly broadly uh, defined currently uh, under the federal criteria. And we suspect that will remain so. Uh, we are also eligible to uh, take uh, funding uh, and offset uh, the losses that we realized um, due to revenues that were not um, uh, received uh, during uh, the last year. And ultimately the, the federal government currently allows us to calculate that, that revenue loss over the next three years. So there's some funding that we can uh, use to offset uh, losses that go to pay for general services. Uh, we can pay for investments in sewer, water, storm drain, uh, broadband uh, infrastructure. Uh, there's an option for premium pay. Uh, to be invested um, towards uh, first responders um, that uh, responded to the pandemic. Um, so what we've been doing is uh, spending a lot of time uh, working with uh, our local nonprofit partners in the community, engaging conversations with uh, our education partners. Uh, there's certainly lots of um, feedback around the impacts to uh, families. Uh, access to childcare is, is top of mind across the board, as we've heard this evening. Uh, mental health uh, issues continue to be also at the top of the list across the spectrum from youth to, to adults. Um, and there's um, certainly a need to identify where we can use some of this funding to impact our small business community and also create an opportunity to uh, leverage new skill sets um, for the workforce that will align with um, our future economy. Uh, so those continue to be the key themes as we work with the council subcommittee uh, and ultimately developing a framework 
Uh, we've begun to get some specific proposals um, in working through some of those um, with the subcommittee as well. We're not prepared right now to make those recommendations, but uh, a lot of those proposals will work themselves out over the course of the next um, several weeks, if not months. Uh, we look forward to bringing those back. But we're being very cautious, one, to make sure that we're leveraging our resources and partnership with uh, local um, resources, uh, but at the same time, uh, keeping an eye towards uh, the future, future federal and state funding that is going to come down uh, in the infrastructure bill, as well as the reconciliation bill. So there's lots of uh, additional funding that we want to make sure we don't uh, prematurely allocate our ARP dollars uh, where we could otherwise go after those, those other funds. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to have Kim uh, walk through a little bit more detail and then give about uh, seven, eight minutes for the council to provide some, some comments. Uh, again, tonight is not um, asking council to give us any direction per se, just a quick update uh, and provide some comments and feedback. Uh, we look forward to being back uh, before the council in the September, early October timeframe with some final recommendations. Thank you. Uh, I think what staff needs to know is, are you comfortable? What are the thinking is at this time, or you have feeling that there's some things that are not there that need to be there. So uh, we'll start with you, uh, Council Member Garcia Cadena. Do you, are you comfortable with the general direction of the recommendation? I am. I am. I, I'm. I, I think we're we're um, going looking at um, in the right direction, and I uh, look forward to hearing more. Thank you, Council Member Fernandez. Um, I, I'd like to see, um, yeah, I think the overall um, I, priorities are, are right on target. I'd like to see some inclusion of uh, the, the eviction moratorium effects that may occur uh, once that is lifted. So I guess maybe more on, on housing. Um, I don't know that I saw that on here. So I think that would be the only thing that I'd like to, to maybe see included on how we help residents um, if they're affected by um, eviction notices. Thank you, Council Member Fernandez. Council Mayor Pro Tem Vega. Sorry, double muted. Okay. <laughs> Uh, no, I think this is the right direction. I'm kind of just something that um, came up uh, this weekend when I, I was meeting with a group is um, just co community outreach. So uh, something that we've discussed is just, you know, as we start to uh, throw some flesh around um, the plan, just to have engaged with the community and also um, maybe pull some of the comments that came out of the Woodland specific plan that the county or the Woodland community meeting that the county uh, put forward uh, to just inform um, and also I'm, that was a from what I understand I didn't attend was a was a great uh, a great event uh, and was well attended. Um, I, you know, I think something that I just want to ensure that we keep in mind is that we leverage the, the federal and state funds um, primarily and use those uh, to any extent possible um, so that we're able to preserve our, our, you know, kind of very modest allocation um, so that overall the community benefits um, to a greater extent, so. Yeah, yeah, thank you for bringing up uh, the outreach um... You know, topic. I failed to mention that in my remarks. Uh, so, in working with the subcommittee, uh, we, you know, toyed with the idea of holding a public meeting uh, in person, similar to the the county's process. Um, our recommendation, I think, the subcommittee supports. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, is actually to try a, a virtual format, both due to the the current health crisis that we're in and escalating case rates, but. I think it also um, could potentially yield uh, a broader set of feedback uh, more at the, you know, the direct household level, as opposed to some of these community meetings where often um, we hear more from some of the, the nonprofits in the community and those that are uh, more engaged. Um, I'm interested in how we can develop a, a survey that we can actually penetrate the neighborhoods and, and get into the households and, and hear directly from them where their needs are, uh, how they've been impacted, and then use that data uh, and work with the subcommittee to come back with some tangible recommendations. So that's the format that, that we're actually recommending. Um, 
if, if the council you know, supports that this evening, we will uh, work with the subcommittee to craft what that survey looks like, uh, push it out over the course of the next uh, two to three, four weeks, uh, and then use that information to help inform um, our decisions as we allocate the funding. Yeah. Ken didn't mention that we do have three years to allocate the money and five years to spend it. So it isn't, uh, it, it isn't a figured out in 60 to 90 days uh, problem at this point. And we have five and a half million in hand at this point. We get another five and a half million next year, as I understand it. Correct. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I, uh, Mr. Landsberg, I don't want to forget you. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, as you and the Mayor Pro Tem sit on your uh, subcommittee, I hope that you focus on a hand up and not a handout. There is, this is an opportunity to to make some significant changes. The area that I, I am particularly interested in, I know it sounds kind of odd, but we need to look at you know, continuing to further uh, search and, and deliver clean, safe drinking water. We don't realize uh, what's happening with this drought and uh, continue to waste water. Um, if, if this trend continues, Mr. Mayor, we're gonna be in trouble. If this money can be used to deliver some clean water for our community, I'd be in favor of that. Thank you. I thank you, Mr. Landsberg. Well, we'll throw that into the mix as well, Mr. Manager. Might as well consult with staff. Anybody have any additional input tonight? No, I just want to thank you and, and the uh, Mayor Pro Tem. I, I don't envy your position in this. You know, I understand that the county has like about 42 and a half million and over 100 million in requests. So it's not an enviable position, but thank you for your efforts. Well, thank you. And uh, the county has offered to partner with us on, on one project. I don't know if Mr. Manager reported on that, but it's a, at 300,000 for us, it's a nominal amount compared to several million from their share. So we're looking at opportunities to partner with other jurisdictions as well to extend uh, the reach of the money. Mr. Manager, any concluding comments on this? Uh, I think that's all for me this evening. And uh, again, look forward to continuing to uh, partner with uh, our local, um, both county and, and nonprofit partners to leverage how we invest these dollars for the best benefit. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, we're about to conclude our meeting, but I always like I'm always happy to hear if there's any afterwards. Anybody have any final comments they want to make? No, we're tired. Uh, yeah, I, you probably tell I'm a little tired too, and I'm sorry if it came across as cranky. Uh, and technolo technology problems, you, we all know how frustrating they are, and there have been a few here. So uh, I'm sure we'll iron all those out. But you are, we are colleagues, and we are here on behalf of the people who elected us to do the work of this community, and I'm proud of us. I feel we work hard and do our very best with the information we have. And I, I, I'm happy to hear from our citizens whether they agree with us or they don't agree with us, but I hope they'll appreciate the fact that we're not getting rich doing this, we're doing this because we care about our community. With that said, everyone, uh, we are adjourned and we'll see you when? September, what is our next meeting? Seven. Seven. Number seven. Yeah. Seven. Hey. Mayor Ballard, I have a, a quick question that uh, uh, yeah. uh, are we planning on going back uh, in person? I know I've gotten some questions from residents who um, are looking forward to attending when we resume in person. I think we were actually con contemplating returning to in person in September until the Delta variant hit as badly as it has hit. Uh, the U.S. Conference of Mayors just canceled their annual meeting and hundreds of us were scheduled to be there. I mean, things like that, are the, we are essentially moving towards a shutdown again. So do you think it's wise that we go back to in-person at this time? Yeah, no, I think, I think continuing virtual um, is, is, I mm -hmm. think, something to do. Just wanted to ask that question. And I'm, I'm encouraging yeah. folks to participate, um, you know, even though we're not in person, encouraging them to send public comments. So um, I think we're at, there's still an ability to participate even though we're not in person. 
Yeah. I think we should reevaluate the issue to whether we go back live in person uh, on a monthly basis. So let's see how we how things progress in, in September. This thing has dropped away before a couple times. It may be it'll drop away again. Then again, it may not. So I would just say facts are going to make the decision for us. Is that agreeable to everybody? Yes. When Vicky's ready to come back, we'll come back. <laughs> All right. With that, again, Vicky are... listens to science, so I'll wait till the science tells us differently. <laughs> <laughs> well, science doesn't seem to make a difference for a lot of folks, but. It does to me too, and I'm sure all of us on this council. Thank you, everyone. Bless you. Have a wonderful evening. Good night. Good night.